Okay, um, so for those of you who, who weren't here yesterday, my name is Amy Husted. Um, I live in Grass Valley in Northern California. Um, I've been in the Master Beekeeping program since uh, its inception. So I'm currently um, trying to complete my master project. Um, and this is a small part of it. So um, I have a, a beekeeping business here in, in Grass Valley. Um, I am not a commercial beekeeper. I, help, I just help um, folks start their hives and do some kind of one-on-one -on -one mentoring and consultation. People have issues and aren't sure what's going on. I need a second pair of eyes. Um, I've been doing that for about four years. And um, I currently have uh, about 16 hives. I try to keep my numbers under 20. Um, I have some, some hives in Grass Valley and some in Newcastle and some in Auburn. And I'm also uh, working for Rob Keller, who has a, a, a bee business in Napa. Um, he uh, manages hives that are at um, some, some pretty fantastic uh, properties out in Napa. Um, so I do that a couple of days a month and I get, get to get to feel um, important <laughs> by checking out some of these amazing uh, properties and keeping bees for some amazing folks. So um, anyway, let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot to plow through uh, this afternoon. So um, once again, welcome to uh, the virtual El, uh, El Nino Bee Lab. Um, the, the goal, one of the goals of the lab is to characterize biotic and abiotic stressors affecting colony health in order to inform development of immediate and long-term solutions for, for bees and beekeepers. Uh, and that goes for backyard beekeepers and commercial beekeepers. We're gonna jump into some rules and regulations. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because as Wendy said, um, that's, we already have a, a wealth of information available to you on that. Um, so we would expect you uh, to know what you as a beekeeper should consider before, before getting bees. And that's gonna be the laws, not only in your city, but in your county and in the state of California. Um, and if, and obviously we don't, no one expects you to memorize all the, you know, the 40 pages of bylaws, but you should at least know where to find those laws. Um, and, and to follow the laws and regulations, it's, it's necessary. So you don't become a lawbreaker. And, you know, the reason laws are in place, as we know, is to keep everyone safe. Um, so there is some federal laws about beekeeping. This mostly has to do with, um, the importation of, of bees and, um, germplasm and whatnot. So um, that is on the Cornell website. If you're so inclined to look that up, you will get this, this link um, as part of the class. So if you're interested in, in um, that heavy duty reading, go ahead and click on that link. Um, the California laws are on the, the, the California Department of Food and Agriculture website. Um, I would definitely take the time to read this. It is quite, um, quite relevant. Um, and again, you will get this, this link, um, in your, in your packet. So, um, the stuff that's important, uh, in this for you specifically, the registration of apiaries, which I'll talk a little bit about, that is a California law, um, to register your apiaries. Um, and again, the, there's also, um, so, oh, so this is the apiary registration program, uh, you can, not only can you register your hives, but you can apply for a serial number brand for use on your equipment. Um, so again, take a look at this if you're interested. Um, I'm, these are two things I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, um, but again, you can click on these links. So regulations for protection of bees has to do with um, pesticides and pesticide application. Um, and so, uh, go ahead and click through on those on your on your uh, in your time and just know where to find them in case it comes up. Um, now this is an example of a county law. This is for San Diego County, so you want to be familiar with your county laws uh, and ordinances that have to do with beekeeping. These are going to be more specific and and um, especially in uh, southern and central California, maybe having to do with uh, overly defensive bees. And um, so let's 
So there is a California law, and it's been in place since January of 2019, that you do have to register your apiaries. Um, the point of this, one of the points of this is that so you'll be notified if there's any um, agricultural sh agriculture spraying going on in your area. Um, now you can register in your county, I know in Nevada and Placer, and I'm not sure about Sacramento, but Nevada and Placer counties, um, you can go to the, that specific county's agriculture um, commissioner website and click through to a document that you can print out and mail in to register. If your county does not have that available, then you would go through the Beware website and that would allow you to register your hives. Um, there's sometimes a cost associated with it. I think um, in Nevada County I, and Placer County, I believe I didn't have to pay um, as long as I had under a certain amount of hives per apiary. But if you have over the amount, it's usually around $10, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, so this is some more information about uh, the Beware program. Um, there is you know, a fine if you do not register your apiaries and you're, you're found out. Um, so again, that law went into effect January 2019. Um, there, you know, there, I'm sure that Leah has talked about this in her presentation, but it is the law to, uh, that you can't keep overly defensive or Africanized bees. And if you click through on this link, uh, you'll be able to read more about that. Um, and this is uh, that language right here. Um, if you wanna read that, basically saying that if someone is determined, or if a hive is determined to be Africanized or overly defensive, then um, that hive can be abated. So this is a, a, a chart from 2018, so it's not, the most current information, but it does give you an idea of the, that, at that time, the distribution of Africanized honeybees, of known Africanized honeybees in California. That might have changed in the last couple of years. So, and then we have city ordinances. So this um, is the, the Davis Municipal Code, and this is the City of Sacramento Municipal Code. So this is going to get down to really specific um, ordinances about where your hives can be and how many hives you can have. And you need to make sure that you're, you know, that you li live in the correct zoned area. Um, so they have, the, you know, the agriculture zones and the mixed use zones. And that's something that you should be familiar with um, your city ordinances. Um, generally, they're, you know, when you're in an urban area, you do need to be very mindful of your neighbors and what the laws are regarding keeping bees. Um, so this is an example of, of the, the city ordinances within the county of San Diego. So um, in Coronado, um, it says basically, it is unlawful and a nuisance for any person to keep or cause to be kept or maintain or control any bees. So if you're in Coronado, uh, you're out of luck. So you do need to pay attention to your city laws. Um, this is a document put out by the University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources. Um, and definitely click, you know, click through on this and read the whole document. The, the link will be, uh, will be in, in your slides. Um, let's see if it's right here. So that this is about best practices for urban beekeepers. It's about a five page document. Um, it's re a really good, good resource. Um, it provides a standard criteria based on beekeeping best management practices for assessing whether a beekeeper has created a nuisance and if so providing guidance for making recommendations about how to mitigate the nuisance and um, it's you know really uh, worth reading. It's put out again it's put out by the University of California ANR. So you need to comply with not only the state regulations, but your county and city regulations as well. So let's move on from that. Um, we're gonna talk about development. We talked a, about, a little bit about that yesterday and we're gonna go more into the pheromone communication, not the, we talked about the waggle dance yesterday, but we're gonna talk more today about pheromones. 
and we're going to go into a little bit of morphology and anatomy. So we looked um, at, at eggs and larvae and pupa and adult uh, yesterday. So this is the metamorphosis, metamorphosis of the honeybee. We start uh, with an egg and the egg hatches into a larva. The larva um, goes and in, turns into a pupa and the pupa emerges as an adult. So you can see the larva is uncapped and the pupa is capped and then the adult emerges. Um, this is the video that we watched yesterday. I think if you didn't see it yesterday, it's definitely worth taking a peek at it again. So we'll go ahead and, and watch that again. I'm going to fast forward to the part where, um, let me see if you can hear it if I take my microphone out here. So this is the, the metamorphosis of the honeybee. Um, in about a 55 second video. Fresh young bee halfway emerged from its brood cell. And bees right now are dealing with several different problems, including pesticides, diseases, and habitat loss. But the single greatest threat is a parasitic mite from Asia, Varroa destructor. And this pinhead sized mite crawls onto young bees and sucks their blood. This eventually destroys a hive because it weakens the immune system of the bees and it makes them more vulnerable to stress and disease. I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward through this part to the actual little clip of the metamorphosis. Here we go. This is a bee egg as it hatches into a larva. And those newly hatched larvae swim around their cells feeding on this white goo that nurse bees secrete for them. Then their head and their legs slowly differentiate as they transform into pupae. Here's that same pupation process, and you can actually see the mites running around in the cells. Then the tissue in their body reorganizes, and the pigment slowly develops in their eyes. The last step of the process is their skin shrivels up and they sprout hair. Okay, so that's um, the complete metamorphosis of bees caught on, on film, it's very cool. Um, so this is the timeline for development. Um, the, the top row is a queen and then the second row is a worker and then the bottom row is a drone. So the time spent as an egg is the same for all the different types of bees and then um, you see some differentiation there. So the total time from, from egg to adult in a queen is 16 days. For worker bees it's 21 and for drones it's 24. Definitely, uh, those three numbers at the end are, are very important. So uh, queen versus worker development. Um, all female larvae are fed the same diet for the first three days. Um, the queens are continually fed royal jelly throughout their development, um, whereas the workers are fed brood food, which is a mix of glandular secretions, pollen, and honey. Um, so we have some, some not only anat anatomical, but behavioral and physiological differences between the queens and the workers. Um, the over ovarials are that kind of similar to the ovaries in humans, but um, you can see underneath the queen in the top right hand corner picture, you can see the developed ovaries of a laying queen. And you can see the difference between uh, the ovaries of the queen and the ovaries of the worker. They're much more developed. Um, and then the, the, the queen has a spermatheca, which we'll see pictures of it later, but that's where the, the sperm is stored. Um, obviously, worker bees don't have that. And then the pollen basket, the queen doesn't have, but the worker bees do have, and that's the um, corbicula. And that's where they, you know, collect and store the pollen as they're out foraging. 
um, workers have a barb sting and queens don't. And then the, there's a, a lot of glands that we talked about yesterday and we'll talk about today as well. Um, they have different types of glands. Uh, the queen and the worker have different types of glands for different purposes. So some um, behavioral differences, uh, obviously the queens fly out and mate, the workers don't. The queens, uh, our main goal is to, to lay eggs and to reproduce, and they also produce a different set of pheromones than the worker bees. Um, and the worker, their life consists of different in-hive tasks when they're younger, and as they get older, then they become forager bees and they go out into the world and collect. Uh, pollen and nectar. So the new, the younger bees are kind of the, the house uh, cleaner bees and then they move on to nurse bees and then as they're, they get a little bit older they can go from undertaker bees to guard bees and then at a certain age they become forager bees. Now that applies most of the year except for in the winter um, things are a little bit different since they're uh, not flying out as much, and they're more more generalists at that time. But um, you can see that the behavioral differences between the queens and the workers are quite different. So, queen versus worker development um, by the fifth instar, and instars are just uh, different uh, stages of development of the the uh, emerging bee. There are significant differences in the developing ovaries between the case the castes of queen and worker. Uh, widespread apoptosis occurs in worker ovaries, which means apoptosis means sort of um, not developing. It occurs in the ovaries, which appears to be mediated in part by juvenile hormone. Um, I encourage you, whether or not you're in the, the program, to take the anatomy class or any anatomy class that, that's offered for bees. It's, it's quite fascinating, and you'll learn about juvenile hormone and all the different uh, hormones during that time, but basically the hormone regulates whether or not the, the ovaries uh, develop. Um, the adult queen possesses 150 to 180 ovarials, while adult, adult workers typically will have between four and seven. Um, there are cases in which workers will lay eggs, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, and then their, their ovaries change a little bit, but they still never um, qu quite reach the same level as a, as a mated queen. So when a new queen is reared, um, there are three situations in which a new queen would be reared, and that would be during swarming, um, when the bees make uh, a new queen to stay while the old queen leaves with the swarm. That's a natural process of colony reproduction. Supersedure is when the current queen needs to be replaced for some reason, either because she's injured or because she's not laying, you know, she's running out of uh, sperm or she's not laying very uh, fertilized eggs. Um, or in an emergency, if the queen dies for some reason or uh, we squish her during an inspection. Um, basic queen biology. Queens emerge after 16 days. Um, the virgin queens will search out the capped queen cells and kill the individual inside if there's multiple uh, queen cells in the hive at that time. The workers will also cull the uh, queen cells once the virgin queen hatches out. Um, if multiple vir virgins come out simultaneously, then um, they will fight to the death. A single virgin queen will survive and mate generally within about a week. And queens will fly out and mate with multiple drones, um, somewhere between 12 and 14, and they should start egg laying within a week of being mated. Um, the virgin queen, we saw a video of this yesterday, I'll, I'll briefly show it again today, but the virgin moves erratically around the frames. Um, she's a lot smaller, she doesn't have a retinue. I'll show you what the retinue looks like, and she's, she flies readily. Um, she's phototactic, meaning she's not uh, afraid of light. Um, a mated queen moves slowly and predictably. She has a larger abdomen. Um, she has a retinue present and she's photophobic, um, which means she's afraid of light and she'll only uh, fly during a swarm. So we saw this videos, both these videos yesterday, so I'm not, not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but um, you can see this one, the, this is a virgin queen emerging out of a cell. And then these are two virgin queens fighting, and I'm not—I'm guessing this is occurring on the pavement and not in the hive because 
uh, they were hatching out of grafted cells, but normally this would occur in the hive and not on the pavement. So let's get through. And then we saw this yesterday, but um, here we have a virgin queen. She's moving erratically, meaning she's zooming around the frames, as you can compare that to this queen who's hardly moving at all. And you can, this is a mated queen, and you can see the retinue around her of bees that are, that are taking care of her needs and also um, helping to spread her pheromone around the hive. This is a mate, mated si mating sign. So this is a queen that's come back from one of her mating flights and that is the remnants of uh, a drone penis that are attached to her abdomen, so. Okay, so mating. Uh, mating is done on the wing, so the drone, and the drones leave a mating sign. So you can see that in the little drawing on the right-hand side there. Um, this occurs uh, in the air in a drone congregation area. The virgin queens will fly out to a drone congregation area where the drones are congregated and uh, the drones will ch chase them around and meet with them in midair and um, their penis breaks off after they've mated and they fall to the ground and die. Um, the queen will make multiple flights and mate with multiple drones, average of 12 to 14. Each drone produces about 5 million sperm in um, a very, very small amount <laughs> of, of semen. And the queens will store um, out of the sperm, they will store four to eight million sperm in their spermatheca. I'll show you a picture of a spermatheca soon here. Um, and there doesn't, like some animals, um, I think, I'm not sure, some mammals even have sperm precedence or competition. Um, there doesn't appear to be any sperm precedence or competition in, in honeybees. Um, so after mating, the queen activates her ovaries and initiates egg laying. It takes a few days, but um, when she starts laying, she will lay you know, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 eggs a day generally. She's no longer phototactic, meaning she, she's photophobic. Um, she won't fly out unless the colony swarms. And her pheromone profiles start to change, and there's large changes in gene expression after mating. So this is, uh, this is a really cool thing. This is a spermatheca. This is where the queen stores um, her sperm. And if you take the anatomy class, you'll get to see one of these, hopefully in the dissection portion. Um, so I believe the spermatheca in the, the middle photo is one that um, has the stored sperm in it. The one on the top has no stored sperm in it. And then the one on the bottom has a suboptimal amount of sperm in it. So uh, when we don't have when we don't have good mating for whatever reason, meaning the queen doesn't maybe doesn't mate with enough drones, or the drones had poor quality sperm for whatever reason, um, this is a problem for the entire hive. Uh, it, it means that the queen will run out of sperm faster, resulting in um, supersedure or perhaps drone laying. Um, reduce genetic diversity in the colony, and this is a problem because genetic diversity is critical for disease resistance and productivity. And then suboptimal pheromone production. The queens inseminated with low volumes of semen produce a less attractive pheromone blend and are more likely to be superseded. So it can be a big problem. So what leads to suboptimal mating? Well, there's things you can't control, like if the queen flies out when there's poor mating conditions or there's bad weather and she doesn't end up mating with enough drones and her little mating window closes, there's not much you can do about that. Um, the things that you might be able to control are the quality of the queens that you're producing in your hives. So you wanna make sure that, um, you know, before you your uh, queens are being reared that the hive is in good shape meaning their nutrition status is good, um, their parasites are low, they're free from diseases. Um, and also the lack of drones, if um, you know it's the time of year when there's not enough drones or the hives aren't making drones for some reason, then that can be a problem for the queens in the area because queen production isn't always linked to drone production. So there are times when there, um, when your hive might not, might not have a queen and they become hopelessly queenless. And this leads to a laying worker situation, which I hope that um, you don't have to deal with, but you probably will eventually at some point in your beekeeping career. 
So this is when a hive has been queenless for a long period of time, and there's no eggs or young larvae present for the hive to make a new queen. Um, the queen pheromone is absent. During this in this situation, worker ovaries can become activated, and workers can begin to lay eggs. So you can see in that picture, um, there's something wrong. I talked yesterday about you know a single egg per cell is a sign of a healthy laying queen. Uh, the laying workers don't seem to, they seem to lay uh, multiple eggs in a cell and often the, there will be, the eggs will be on the sides of the cell because their abdomens aren't long enough to reach the bottom. Um, so you'll, you'll, you'll see that for sure. You'll see multiple eggs per cell. Now it doesn't always mean that, that it's a laying worker, but if the other signs are there, then it, it it's, uh, can be diagnostic. Um, when those eggs get capped, they're unfertilized, so that means they're going to be males. So if you pull pull a frame out and it's covered with drone drone um, uh, drone cells all over, then you know you might have a problem. Um, the colony will become all drones, and 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 obviously they're not uh, going to survive that. Um, the problem is is that the brood pheromone is present when a laying worker is laying. The brood pheromone is being produced, and so. The bees think that they have a queen because there's brood pheromone present. So if you just go and stick a queen in there, it's it's not gonna they're not gonna accept that queen because they think everything is okay. So it can be a real challenge to fix these colonies. Um, one of the ways that people do it is by shaking all the bees out about 50 yards from from the hive, and then the the foragers fly back. And the foragers, um, if you Sometimes you can add a new queen in that situation and they'll accept it, um, but it's, it's, it's tricky. Um, so just be aware that of, the, of that situation can occur and uh, the signs to look for. So let's talk about pheromone communication. Um, this is the main way that bees communicate within the hive. Uh, pheromones can identify uh, colony members there are lots of different pheromones. There's queen pheromone, alarm pheromone, brood pheromone, nasonal pheromone, and many more. Um, each colony has its own smell, and workers use it to identify non-colony mates. The smell is acquired uh, usually after about 24 hours, so newly emerged bees can be placed in any colony, and they, um, they won't be uh, kicked out. Um, the alarm pheromone from, is released um, at different times, but often when you're stung, an alarm pheromone is released. And then the brood pheromone is present, obviously, when there's brood present, and that communicates to the bees that there's brood present and we need to take care of it. So the queen uh, produces many pher pheromones from multiple glands. Um, some of those glands are mentioned here, the mandibular gland, the turgle and tarsal glands, and the duforous gland. Um, the composition of the pheromones depends on age, mating status, and the quality of the queen. And this, the, these pheromones really regulate the social organization of the hive. They, they indicate to the workers that there is a queen present and that everything is as, as it should be um, or not as it should be potentially um, based on the quality of the pheromones. There are synthetic uh, versions available for that you would use for for different reasons, maybe science or like swarm lures um, are available as the synthetic pheromone. So let's talk about morphology. Um, morphology is a study of the form and structure of organisms and their specific structural features. So we have the external morphology of the bee, which is all visible parts. Um, in the honeybee, we have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen as the three main parts. And then all the internal uh, morphology or the <laughs> invisible mystery honeybee parts. Um, there are case specific morphological features like just by looking at this picture we go from worker to drone to queen. Um, you know that there's different, uh, some of the glands are, are di present or absent or bigger or smaller so um, I recommend if you're serious about beekeeping to get uh, an anatomy book, there's a couple out there and, and kind of explore some of this stuff because it's really, really fascinating. So again, we have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So let's start with the, the front end. So this is the, um, the, you can see the proboscis sticking out, the antenna, the, the 
the two compound eyes, um, the ocelli, which is on, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but it's a structure on the top of the head, um, the compound eyes, the mouth parts, and the antenna. The antenna um, are pretty interesting. They can perceive chemicals. They can uh, sense the movement of air, vibrations, temperature, and humidity. It's pretty amazing. Um, the mouth parts consist of the mandible, the maxilla, the labial pelvis, the glossa, and the labellum. Um, the proboscis is the main, the main uh, part that's kind of like a straw, and that allows the bees to suck nectar or uh, water or to, sh to share food, to give food to uh, other hive members, and um, aids in drying the nectar. The mandible is for chewing and manipulating wax, um, cleaning, grooming other bees, or biting. So this is the um, this little slice of the, the inside, the, the head, the nervous system, the brain, is really the mushroom body that's kind of the brain. Um, but there's also in the head, there's also the, um, the optical lobe and the antenna lobes. The optical lobe re receives visual information and the antenna lobes is for receiving the information that we talked about from the antenna, like the chemical and the humidity. Um, the mushroom body, again, is kind of like the brain. It's information processing, olfactory learning, short and long-term memory formation. And the subesophageal ganglion connects the brain to the rest of the nervous system. So it's kind of like our spinal cord in a way. It innervates sensory organs and mouth part muscles. Endocrine glands are also present in the head. Um, so, I'm oh, sorry, let me go back here. The exocrine glands, um, the mandibular glands are the source of, in queens, they're the source of queen mandibular pheromone. Um, let's go back a minute here. So the difference between uh, endocrine and ex exocrine, endocrine is uh, like hormones that stay within the the um, that stay within the bee and exocrine are ones that exocrine glands are um, the pheromones. So so endocrine glands produce hormones, exocrine glands produce pheromones. So hormones stay within the organism, and pheromones are outside of the organism. So the mandibular glands are the source of queen mandibular pheromone. Um, and in workers, they're the source of brood food and the alarm pheromone. So those are produced near the mandible. Those are, that's the a slice of a hypopharyngeal gland, which is the source of the brood food um, and an enzyme to break down sucrose. Okay, so let's move to the thorax. So that's a little sliced off uh, wing there. And you can see under the microscopic view here that the, the wing has uh, these little hooks on it called hemuli, and they hold the wings together. And that's uh, a sliced, sliced off the top of the bee. So you can see the muscles that, that innervate the wings. And then uh, honeybees have three pairs of legs and the foragers use um, the corbicula, the, the pollen basket, which we all know about um, for collecting pollen. Okay, so the, the legs, uh, part of, parts of the legs are the, the femur, the tibia, and the bas basotarsis nerve. That's, those are the front legs at the beginning. And then the, the second picture is the hind legs. So you can see the difference between the legs that have the, the pollen basket and the legs that don't. The, Front legs have that little antenna cleaner on it. You can see that little notched out bit. Um, that's for cleaning off or brushing off the antenna. And then the pollen basket on the back leg. And that little uh, pollen press, that little uh, press in the joint of that leg. And there's pollen brushes on the inner surface of the leg. Okay, abdomen. So this is the, uh, the wax glands, let me go back. 
So the, the, you can see the, the underside of the um, abdomen and the wax is being produced there. That's where the wax glands are located. This is the inside of the abdomen. It has the digestive tract. That's the stomach that you can see that, um, that segmented bit. Um, now you, here, the abdomen also houses the reproductive tract. Um, the drone is that top right-hand picture. You can see the testes and the sem seminal vesicles in there. That would be a mature reproductive tract of the drone. Um, and also you can see uh, the crop, which is the, the honey stomach, and then the ventriculus and the rectum. Now in the bottom picture of with this is worker underneath. Those are, that's the reproductive tract of the worker. That's not, you know, not in use. And then compare that to the queen a reproductive tract in the bottom right hand corner. Okay, so here's a closer, a closer look at the digestive tract. So we start at the top where the crop is, that's the honey stomach. Um, and then the, the esophagus you can see coming off, it's very small bit coming off the top. Then you have the proventriculus and the ventriculus, which is the main stomach. Um, and, that, and then the rectum, obviously that's the end. That's the end bit. So not that different from, from humans really. So the crop carries nectar. Um, the proventriculus has the teeth-like structure that remove pollen grains and stops uh, regurgitation. And then the main part of the stomach, the ventriculus, the kidneys are the, um, I think it's pronounced malphigian tubules. That's sort of the analogous kidneys. And then the rectum obviously collects excrement. I'm sure we've all been pooped on by a bee at some point. Okay, here's the male reproductive tract. Um, the first picture is an immature drone and the second picture is the mature drone. So let's focus on that uh, mature drone. You can see the, the testes and the seminal vesicles. And then it also has the, uh, the stomach in that, in that picture. And then the bulb of the penis is, is the part that is, uh, comes off and it stays, stays stuck in the queen. So the testes produce sperm. Um, the mucus glands produce seminal protein, so basically the, the fluid that the sperm is in, the, the semen. And then the bulb of the endophallus is uh, averted at mating. And that's it right there. Nice little close-up shot. That's the semen packet right there. Okay, reproductive tract. Here's the normal worker on the, on the top left, laying worker on the top right. So you can see, even though this is just a drawing, you can see that in the laying worker, the ovaries develop somewhat. Um, and then the bottom picture is a queen. Um, and again, I highly encourage you to take the anatomy class when it's offered. Um, you'll get to actually see these things under the microscope. And it's really, really, really interesting. Um, you can also see in this picture the venom sac is, uh, from the worker and the Dufour's gland. Um, and then again, the, the ovaries of the queen, um, that there's 150 to 180 and only, only four to seven in the worker. Then the lateral and the median oviducts. And again, here's the spermatheca. So you can see the spermatheca from the virgin queen um, is clear and the spermatheca from the mated queen is full of, full of sperm. Okay, so we're gonna shift gears for a minute um, and talk about immunity. We talked a little bit about this yesterday, but we're gonna go, go more into it today. Um, as we know, honeybees are a host to, to many parasites and pathogens. Um, the, the biggest problem currently um, is the varroa mite, which is a parasite. And then pathogens uh, include bacteria, viruses, and microsporidia. Um, in this picture we have, uh, in the top picture is a bee with, uh, you can see it has two varroa mites attached to it and also has deformed wing virus. And then in the bottom um, picture is uh, showing a hive that has a uh, nosema in infection. That, that's the sort of one of the telltale signs of nosema is the, the dysentery associated with it, which is like diarrhea basically. 
Um, okay, so pathogen invasion is, uh, pathogens invade via a natural or created openings on an individual. So um, there's different ways of transmission. There's vertical and horizontal. A horizontal transmission um, is from individual to individual, either by sharing of food or um, by, you know, coming in contact with contaminated feces or their, you know, bees have STDs too, uh, just like people. Then there's vertical transmission, which is mother to offspring. So the mother, um, the mother transmits the disease to the, to the offspring. And then via parasites or varroa, um, just like mosquitoes and ticks, varroa carry uh, pathogens that they transmit to bees. And then there's fomites. Um, in beekeeping, we are the fomites. Uh, we are the objects that can carry pathogens either by beekeeping equipment or hive tools or gloves. So um, just be aware of that when you're going from hive to hive that we um, can carry diseases with us as we go from hive to hive. Oh, okay, so, oh, whoops. So yeah, viruses and food are two ways. Um, so how, how do honeybees, how, how have they developed ways to deal with all of these issues? Um, honeybees have developed individual immunity and they've also developed social immunity. And we're gonna go into all of these things. Um, we're gonna start with uh, individual immunity. So innate immunity is how your body has evolved to deal with pathogens and invaders. Um, humans have a closed circulatory system, so our blood is, uh, stays in our veins and arteries and vessels. Um, but bees have an open circulatory system, so their hemolymph is sort of bathes their entire uh, body. It goes throughout the whole body. It doesn't stay in a vein or a vessel. Um, so there's a dorsal vessel, and then they can see that running up the, um, along the top of the bee. And the blood goes through that, but then it goes out and around. You can see where the arrows are going through the whole entire bee. Uh, Hemocytes and antimicrobial peptides circulate in the hemolymph. So um, hemocytes and antimicrobial peptides are things that fight against disease and that circulate throughout the, the body of the bee. Okay, so the modulation of immune response in honeybees. Um, there's been several studies on this, uh, this one having to do with developmental stage and case cast Sorry. Um, so in this study, there was a lower level response in larval stages of both drones and workers and a lower response in drones than in workers. So their immune response was lower in those particular uh, age groups of bees. And there was a greater resistance to pathogens found in foragers. This sort of makes sense because the foragers are the ones out in the world getting exposed to all these pathogens. So they were found to have a greater resistance, whereas the younger bees and the drones that aren't really doing as much um, are having a lower level response. And then there's a study in 2005 um, that showed that uh, a high parasite infestation or by varroa actually suppresses the immune response and supports viral amplification. And we know more about that now because um, of Samuel Ramsey's work showing that the uh, varroa mites feed on the fat bodies of the bees and the fat bodies regulate the immune system. And um, if that fat body is damaged, then um, any virus that's transmitted by the mite is going to uh, have an easy time of it. Um, and then there's nutrition can, can support the bee's immune system. Um, so if bees are feeding from, on pollen from diverse floral sources, then they have improved resistance to Nozema. And again, that makes sense too, because if you if you're, have a diverse diet, um, you're probably going to be healthier, uh, just like in people. So nutrition is important, um, and it's important for bees to have diverse floral sources. Okay, so that's innate immunity. 
So now we're gonna talk about social immunity. Social immunity is collective defenses against pathogens and parasites. And this is more of a, a sort of a group behavior as opposed to um, an innate immunity, which takes place with the individual. Um, so hygienic behavior is one of those uh, social responses. This is a behavioral response where workers detect and remove parasitized or infected um, immature either pupa, well pupa. Um, and they, so you'll see this in your hive, you'll see um, uncapping and removal of brood. And that's a hygienic behavior when, when the worker bees detect that there's something wrong with that pupa, that it's disease, they'll remove it. Um, bees will detect and remove American foul, foul brood infected larva, that's a hygienic behavior. They remove the varroa mites that are in the, that, um, that capped pupa. Um, there's like, there's a genetic uh, basis for this. That's why there's uh, strains of um, hygienic bees that you can, that you can buy. Um, one, of the, one of the current one that's available is of um, varroa sensitive hygienic bees that was, were developed by Harris and Spivak. Um, so, so the way that you test for hygienic behavior, we're going to actually watch this video, but let me show you the picture first, um, is by killing brood in a, in a certain area, you can um, go back 24 to 48 hours, I think it's 48 hours later, and see if they've removed all that dead brood. So let's go ahead and watch as Bernardo does um, this demonstration of how to test for hygienic behavior and how to quantify it. So. Um, there's no, he's not talking at all in this video, so I'm going to talk, uh, talk you through it. So he's going to go ahead and remove a brood frame from the middle of the hive. So he needs to find a frame that has a good uh, section of solid capped brood on it. So, so right there in the middle, he's found a good candidate. Now he takes this, um, I believe it's a, a section of a PVC pipe. And he's going to go ahead and um, move the bees away from a section and place that on there so that he can pour in the pipe a uh, liquid nitrogen. The liquid nitrogen will kill all the bees under the cap, the cap, um, the cap cells. Now he's got a section that he wants to use. He's going to squish that down in there to prevent the nitrogen from leaking all over the frame. And then after he's done that, he's going to count the cells that are already empty. Um, so that he doesn't count those in his final tally. Now he's going to get um, liquid nitrogen and pour it into that section and kill all those, those uh, pupae that are under those caps. So you put a little bit in, you wait for it to, to um, settle and make sure that it's not going to leak out of that, out of that pipe. I'm just going to let that go ahead and uh, settle. So that has effectively killed all the, the brood under the capping. Now he's gonna go ahead and remove that uh, pipe in a moment. And he's gonna put the frame back and then uh, he'll come back 24 and 48 hours later. And by the 48 hour mark, um, the bees, if they are hygienic, they should have removed 95% of that dead brood. He's going to mark that frame so he knows which one it was, so he can go pull that out quickly. And that's it. So that's a way to test to see if bees have that uh, developed um, hygienic trait. Another response uh, 
is called social fever. And that is a response where workers increase the temperature in the hive. Um, they accomplish that by their, those thoracic muscle contractions by heating, uh, by tensing up those muscles and um, vibrating, they can actually heat up the hive. So um, there was a study in 2000 that showed that if workers detected a fungus such as chalk brood, uh, they will heat that brood patch to kill the spores because they, um, they won't uh, germinate in, the, in a higher temperature. So they'll only germinate when it's below 32 degrees. So that's social fever. That's one, another response to uh, pathogens. And then self-medicating. Um, we talked about propolis yesterday and that it is uh, a, resin -like, a resin collected just like pollen. It's used to plug holes, but it's also lines the nest cavity. And we talked about it being an uh, antimicrobial envelope. Um, and it improves colony level defenses. There's been lots of studies about this, um, about propolis and its, its antimicrobial properties. So that's one way that these um, try to fight disease on the colony level. So self-removal, this is interesting. Um, I looked at both of these studies uh, and I can, I actually have them uh, you can actually read the entire study on Google Scholar if you're interested. Um, the, whole, the whole paper is available on Google Scholar. Um, so in the first study, honeybees were treated with a drug that, um, that caused it is cytostatic, but it, it caused an increased mortality rate. And even the foragers that survived that drug application, they um, removed themselves from from the colony more readily than bees that were not treated with this drug. So they, by removing, they went away and they didn't come back. So they, were, they knew they were sick and they left the colony rather than die within the colony. Um, so this, is, this suggests an adaptive mechanism to save the colony from an infective disease. And that's also why um, there is an undertaker job in the, in the colony. The undertakers remove dead bees. They don't let them sit around and just kind of waste away and so that they don't spread infected diseases. And there was another study about uh, bees. This is the 2012 study at the bottom about bees that had deformed wing virus. And um, Worker bees will actually remove sick bees, and that's based on changes in their cuticular, cuticular hydrocarbons. If you want to look that up, it's, it's also really interesting. But um, they'll detect this change in the hydrocarbons, and that will that tells them that the, the adult bee is sick, and they will remove that bee from the colony. Okay, um, can we pause for questions right here, Wendy? Is there any questions I need to address? Uh, we're doing well. Thank you. Okay, so it's only two o'clock, so we'll go a little bit more. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. So actually, I'm going to um, skip down. We'll go back to splitting, but I want to skip down to this section here, and then we'll go back to the splitting since we're talking about um, diseases. So. Um, we're going to talk about how to manage. You know, what do what can we do as beekeepers to manage, um, to help the bees to manage these these pests and pathogens. Um, so this is a, a a chart that has the the history of honeybee losses all the way back to 1940. Um, you can see that there was these are reported losses. So you know, it's not necessarily across the board here, but. Um, you can see when the tra tracheomite hit, and then you can see in 1987 uh, the, when we found varroa mites in our colonies. Um, and then <laughs> it goes down all the way to about 2008, I believe, in this chart. So um, let's talk a little bit about this. In 2006 and 2007, uh, that was when colony collapse disorder was first reported. And um, as you know, the media took that and ran with it. Um, and this is a, a more uh, recent, well, 2017 um, 
some some information about annual losses. So you can see the the acceptable winter loss is the gray bar, and then the total reported winter loss is the yellow bar, and the total annual loss is the orange bar. And California, so we have a total annual loss by state. This again is 2016, 2017. And um, California had about 30% loss in, that was reported in that time period. So what about CCD? We've all heard about CCD. What is it exactly? Um, CCD is a syndrome that's characterized by a specific set of, of symptoms. Um, it's not, you know, people have lost their hives over the winter and they say, oh, it must have been CCD, when, when really most likely it was probably mites or some other disease that's known. But CCD is, a, like it says here, it's characterized by a specific set of syndromes. So a rapid loss of adult workers with disproportionately high brood population and the presence of a queen. Um, there's no dead bees in and around the hive at all. They're just gone. So it's not, you know, when you find dead bees in and around the hive, there's probably an explanation for that. It's not CCD. Um, and then there's a delayed invasion by hive pests and robbing by nearby hives. These are very specific um, occurrences. And it's reported by only about 7% of beekeepers during overwintering losses. So what causes CCD? Now, the, the slide has a bunch of, of information on it, but basically, um, there's a, a lot of studies like around 2009 that tried to explain CEC and basically it's a synergistic effect of multiple factors, nutrition, disease, microbes, all kinds of uh, nutritional stress. Th that is the cause of CCD. Um, it's not mites. <laughs> So what, what affects honeybees? What causes these, these problems? Um, there's a lot that can affect the health of the honeybee. Um, the climate, the nutrition supply, the bee, or the food supply, farmer practices, are the bees in a monoculture? Are they in a, a cornfield in Nebraska where there's no other nutrition at all? Um, is there pesticide being applied? Um, are there residues in the hive? Uh, and then what the beekeeper is doing to, uh, to help or not help the honeybee, are they moving them to pollination? Are they treating them for disease? All of these things affect the health of the honeybee. So there's a, there's a, a ton of things that can go in um, to the honeybee health. So, so what, do, what do we do about all this? There's so many things that are outside of our control. Um, so we want to utilize an integrated pest management approach, a decision-making process based on understanding the host, so understanding the honeybee and the pest biology and their interactions. Um, our actions are going to be based on threshold. So we talked about doing an alcohol wash and the threshold of mite, uh, mite infestation. We want to use multiple tactic, tactics. We don't want to rely on just one tactic. Um, and whatever we do needs to be safe and affordable and environmentally friendly. Um, so this is, again, that pyramid of IPM tactics. At the top, we have conventional pesticides, which are you know, highly toxic. So we want to avoid using those. And then we go to um, the less toxic uh, biorational pesticides, the, what's considered organic. Um, formic acid, oxalic acid, which is not legal in California yet. Um, essential oils, nose of it, um, hot beta acids, those things, while they might, you know, be higher on the toxicity scale, they are lower than the conventional pesticides. And then, um, again, there's not much biological for mites, uh, but there are for, for hive beetles, um, but those would be, you know, less toxic. And then we want to look at the physical and mechanical and the cultural um, tactics as being less toxic and more preventative. So like using uh, drone combs or drone frames, which I'll show you in a moment, 
drone brood removal, screen bottom boards, the mites fall down and they have a hard time climbing back up. Um, you know, powdered sugar, we'll talk about that. That's a bit controversial. Um, and then hive beetle traps and, you know, maybe caging the queen from time to time using resistant bee stock. Those are all things that combined with um, the, the chemicals that we can use to control the pests and the, the other parasites. So knowledge is power. Know what's going on in your hives. Um, keep in mind the cost benefit of whatever you do. You have to know your host and pest biology and know the symptoms of specific stressors. And you're gonna monitor for certain stressors like Varroa. And then you wanna prevent rather than intervene if possible, but have a plan for, and have a plan for prevention and treat if necessary. So the most common problem is, as we've talked about lots, is the Varroa mite. Um, and we, we talked about doing um, an alcohol wash. And if you weren't here yesterday, uh, the alcohol wash is the, the most uh, reliable way to count the, um, your mite infestation. And what I'll do as we get close to the end, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pull up Randy Oliver's website so we can all see where we can get that alcohol wash information and also some other really good information about mites. Um, you can use an uncapping fork and uncap, um, you know, 100 brood cells and count the mites in there. You can do a, a sugar shake, which is like an alcohol wash, but with powdered sugar. You can use sticky boards to count your mite drop over a 24 hour period. Um, this says the threshold for a sugar, a powdered sugar shake is three to four mites. I'm assuming because it, the sugar shake is not as um, reliable as the alcohol wash. Um, and then the sticky board count, uh, this is five to 10 mites, I guess that's over a 24 hour period. Um, so those, the viral mite is the most common problem. And then there's, you know, also viruses and brood diseases. And the way that we diagnose viruses is, is generally, you know, most of your back, backyard beekeepers would be a visual diagnosis, but there are, you know, if you if you have, <laughs> If you have access to the lab, you could do some molecular diagnosis. And then we're not really sure what the threshold is for some of these viruses. Um, another common, hopefully not too common problem in California apiaries is uh, foul brood, American foul brood, um, and nosema. Now, we, now American foul brood, um, hopefully you'll never come across this in your beekeeping career but it's a bacterial disease. It's extremely, um, it's extremely devastating to the hive and it causes larval meltdown, um, which a lot, when you stick a little toothpick in the cap, you can pull out a, a rope of the larva and that's a diagnostic for foul brood. And you'll see concave cappings with punctures and black scales at the bottom of the cells. Now, there is no threshold for this. If you see it, you have to do something immediately. Um, and then there's nosema. Um, there's two types of nosema. The way that we diagnose nosema is microscopy. microscopy. Um, and I believe there are some, some test kits out there available, available for purchase as well. Um, and then um, the threshold, you know, if we're not really sure. Uh, you know, there might be a, little, a bit of nosema in your hive, but it, at some point it will overwhelm the hive. Um, so we're gonna talk a bit about cultural control. So at the bottom of this pyramid here, um, one aspect of cultural control is sanitation. So you wanna minimize your pest pathogen transfer. So practice good hygiene, um, just like we're all doing right now by washing our hands and wearing masks. Um, as you go from hive to hive or from apiary to apiary, if you only have one or two hives in your, in your yard, I would at least recommend um, either flame torching your hive tool in between hives or um, using a different, having a one hive tool per hive or per hive stand um, if you don't wanna flame torch your stuff. Um, and then if, you, if you're in a situation where you have to wear gloves, um, I, that's why I like those rubber coated gloves or latex gloves is because um, when I wear my rubber gloves, I just, I put a little bit of rubbing alcohol on in my hands as I go in between each hive and just wipe them down. I know rubbing alcohol is a bit hard to get right now, but you could also use bleach, a bleach solution. 
um, to clean your gloves. And definitely you want to use different equipment in, in different apiaries if you, have diff if you have multiple apiaries. And then please wash your veil every once in a while. I know it's hard. Um, <laughs> and I know once you wash it, it just still doesn't look clean. But washing it helps remove some of those um, pathogens. If you're going to reuse equipment, if it's, I mean, if it's yours, that's one thing. But if someone gives you like a bunch of equipment, um, if you don't know for sure the history of that equipment, don't use it. Um, it could have had foul brood on it. It's not worth it. Frames are cheap. Please, you know, please don't reuse it unless, you know, if, if it's woodenware, you can wash it with a 10% bleach solution. Um, I will often uh, torch the inside of my boxes. Um, there's a heat treatment you can apply. There's UV light for nosema. Um, definitely culling old comb and, and um, not reusing it is, is a good idea. If, if you're reusing equipment, I would never reuse comb that I didn't, I didn't know the history of. Um, if you're using your, reusing your own equipment that's been sitting around, you definitely want to freeze the frames. Like if it's last year's equipment and you're going to use it uh, this spring, I would freeze the frames at some point before you reuse it for 24 or 48 hours in the freezer. That will kill any wax moth or small hive beetle larva that's hanging around. Um, I guess gamma irradiation is a, is a possibility if you have access to that, um, but that would kill a lot of, uh, a lot of these things. But for most backyard beekeepers, you know, torching and freezing is a good option um, for your woodenware. But try not to reuse frames and comb um, unless it's your own stuff. Um, and then minimizing pesticide exposure. So if you're renting your bees out for pollination, um, you definitely want to communicate with the growers and to uh, ask when the crop is sprayed. And, you know, again, knowledge is power with this stuff. You really don't want a lot of this stuff, the, the pesticides and the, the fungicides and the miticides in your, in your wax, it builds up. Um, so communication is really important if you're planning on renting your bees out for pollination. And then after pollination, you wanna give the hives uh, time to recover. Um, and then pro provide an area with plenty of clean and diverse forage because after being in the almonds for a few weeks, they won't have had a lot of diverse forage. And like a lot of the miticides and the pesticides are found in the pollen and wax. So provide balanced nutrition. Honeybees need a diversity of pollen sources. This improves their immune and detox response to pathogens and um, helps deal with pests and even pesticides. So your hives should be in an area with a variety of floral sources. If you have, you know, growers in your area that are, that are interested and willing to, um, you know, plant some, some wildflowers and some hedgerows and stuff, anything that you can communicate with, with um, your neighbors to, to try not to spray things or to at least communicate when they are going to spray things. Um, and then, Feed a pollen substitute if, if your bees aren't bringing in pollen. This can be important, especially if you're gonna uh, rent out your colonies for pollination. You need to have a strong colony in February. So you might wanna consider feeding a pollen substitute in the late summer or fall and throughout the winter to build you know, 20 frames of bees for pollination. And then during and after pollination, they're only going to be getting um, almond pollen during that time. So you would also want to add an additional uh, pollen substitute because nutrition you know is the foundation for health and provide a clean water source now you know we all know that bees like the mucky pond water um, as opposed to the nice clean water dish that we put out by clean that means we don't want them drinking like agricultural runoff water <laughs> um, and you know as much as we can can't control where they get their water from, um, providing water that's not uh, filled with ag runoff is probably a really good idea. And there are benefits, there's a guide, I'm sorry that you can't read that, um, I will fix that. But there is a, a website 
that has beneficial plants for your region. And there's lots of information out there about um, wildflowers and plants that are uh, easy to, or that are native and beneficial for all pollinators, not just honeybees. Okay, so another means of culture control is using resistant bee stock. Um, and usually these are called hygienic honeybee stocks, like Varroa sensitive hygienic, Minnesota hygienic. Those are strains that are available for purchase. Um, so in these hygienic bee stocks, nurse bees can detect and remove disease and Varroa infested brood. So like we saw in that um, demonstration that Bernardo did where he poured the nitrogen on, um, if they remove 95% of those dead bees, um, this, these pictures show the same sort of experiment, only not in a, in a circular pattern. Um, they're gonna remove 95% of the dead bees that qualifies them as hygienic. So, um, you know, the, the hygienic lines that have been bred, and then um, supposedly Russian bees are hygienic. Saskatraz is kind of a new one, um, well, new to me anyway. Uh, that's supposed to be hygienic. Or if you're regularly testing your bees for hygienic behavior and they're passing that 95%, you can breed your own. Continue to breed off of that queen and continue to test and, and uh, you know, that's an option. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a physical and mechanical control, which is also again at the bottom of that period. Um, this mostly is, is works for Varroa mite, but it also works for small hive beetle. Um, so one way to uh, control the Varroa mite life cycle is to break the honeybee brood cycle by caging the queen. Uh, or when you're splitting colonies, that, that happens as well. But if you cage the queen and you stop the honeybee life cycle for a time, uh, the Varroa mites can't reproduce because as we know, they reproduce in the... Um, the cell of the, the capped pupa. So if there's no capped pupa, then there's no, there's no place for them to reproduce. So some people, and I've done this as well a lot in, in my job in Napa, we cage the queen for a while, and that reduces the mite load. Um, so I said I would talk about drone comb removal. So up in the right-hand corner, there's a picture of a, it's a drone frame. Now what that is, is a specific type of frame that you can buy. It's bright green plastic, and the, um, the, the foundation is it's a one piece, so it's solid, a solid plastic uh, frame. Foundation is sized for drone comb. So the bees will only build a drone comb on that frame, and also they'll cap honey in, on it sometimes eventually too in that picture. But what you do is you allow them to um, draw that comb out. You allow the queen to put drone uh, eggs in those cells, and then after it's capped, you have to pull that out. <laughs> it doesn't work if you don't pull, the, pull that frame out, so you have to stay on top of it. Once you pull that frame out, you can, um, you can freeze that frame and then remove the, the uh, pupa out and put it back in and repeat the whole cycle. Now the reason why this, uh, this is somewhat effective is that mites prefer to reproduce in drone cells probably because they're in there for a bit longer. Like we know that they're in there for 24 days as opposed to 21 uh, with the workers. So they, uh, pr their, their preference is for drone, um, for drone cells. So you tend to have a higher rate of mites in those cells. So by removing them after they're capped, you will trap a lot of mites in there and kill them in the freezer. But you have to remove that frame out when it's capped. Otherwise you're just breeding a bunch of mites. Um, I did it once and I took that frame out and I put it in the freezer and that was like four years ago and it's still in the freezer. So <laughs> it just seemed like a lot of work for me. But if you have a couple of hives in your backyard, you know, it, it would be, you know, again, it's not going to reduce your mite load by a massive amount, but it is going to help. Okay, powdered sugar dusting. I know this is really controversial, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and talk about it. Um, it's where I live in Grass Valley, it's quite common for people to use powdered sugar um, as their entire, um, their entire uh, IPM <laughs> triangle. Uh, my neighbor 
is Janet Brisson. She makes the Country Room screen bottom boards that you might be familiar with. They're really high quality um, screen bottom boards. She's been doing nothing but powdered sugar dusting for the last 25 years. So this is kind of how I, I cut my teeth in beekeeping, doing powdered sugar dusting. Um, from my anecdotal and personal experience, it can be effective in controlling your mite population. I know not everyone's going to agree with me and that's fine. Um, again, I don't think it's um, the end all be all. I think you have to use other methods and you have to monitor your mite loads and when they get too high, you have to do something. But um, this is and can potentially be an effective way to lower your numbers, maybe not get them under threshold, but lower them. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not, I'm, Randy Oliver has done experiments on this. It's, you know, it's something that, in fact, that picture, the middle picture is uh, Randy and Eric, his son Eric, doing powdered sugar dusting. So, you know, we can, we can discuss the, the pros and cons of this offline if you'd like or later, but I'm going to mention it. So um, there's videos of how to do it online, but basically you are using um, a cup, a cup and a half of powdered sugar to dust the tops of the boxes. You want to use a CNH powdered sugar and you want it to be sifted so it's fine, um, not clumped up. And you can, you can knock down uh, quite a few bites by doing this powdered sugar dusting, but you have to have a screened bottom board, otherwise the, the powdered sugar will just build up on the bottom, the solid bottom board. So um, again, you still have to monitor your mite loads and treat if the powdered sugar dusting isn't working. I got to, to, to tell you my story about it, I got to the point where it, it stopped working for me, and so I started using you know Formic and Timol and stuff. Um, so it, it can work, it doesn't always work. But again, you have to have a screen bottom board um, and the screen bottom boards, just having screen bottom boards and not doing any powdered sugar dusting um, is also a physical mechanical way to um, prevent, you know, some, some of your mite load because when the mites fall down, they have a hard time crawling back up. So, you know, are those cost effective for you? Maybe, maybe not. Something to definitely look at. Screen bottom boards um, have a lot of different uses. So. Definitely using a combination of all these different methods will um, help to keep your mite load down. Uh, physical mechanical control for hive beetles. Um, we saw a picture of a beetle trap, which is a little plastic tray that you put in between the frames. You put some vegetable oil in it um, and the beetles will crawl in and, and drown. There's lots of different types of beetle traps. You can use paper towels, you can use Swiffers. These are all mecha physical and mechanical control for a hive beetle. And uh, sanitation is important for a small hive beetle control, keeping um, your hives in the sun, keeping um, the underneath, underneath of your hives clean and um, not allowing the, hive, the beetles to pupate underneath your hives. Um, I think, Wendy, I'll just get through this section and then we'll take a break. So I'm going to talk about chemical control. Um, absolutely, we need to post that link again of uh, the Honeybee Health Coalition guide to all of these, uh, these lovely organic chemicals or soft chemicals as we refer to them. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to use each and every single one of them. Um, Formic and Timol that are at the top of the list and they're the most common and the most widely used and there's tons of information and the Honeybee Health Coalition has a guide to when, who, what, when, where, and why for the formic, the thymol, hot beta acids um, and videos are, you can link through to the videos from the Honeybee Health Coalition guide. Um, you know, they're widely used, widely effective, highly recommended. There are some risks uh, to both Formic and Timol, um, but you will be using these in your beekeeping career. So go ahead and, and definitely, if you haven't downloaded that Honeybee Health Coalition guide, I have it on my phone so I can pull it up and refer to it whenever I need it. Um, it's really a handy uh, PDF that you should have with you. Um, oxalic acid, not legal in California. 
Um, Randy Oliver is doing a lot of work on, on getting that uh, to, for use uh, in California, so hopefully soon. And the hot beta acids, known as HopGuard, maybe not as effective. Um, that, that is something that's also in the Honeybee Health Coalition Guide. And then um, Kumafos is for, Kumafos, Subalinate, and Amitraz, not, not used so much anymore. But definitely Formic and Timol, widely used, widely recommended. So um, these are the more hard chemicals. This is the very, very top of that pyramid. Um, these would be the chemicals you'd be using for nosema. So fumagellin, not available in California at all. Uh, nose of it is the only thing for, that's available for nosema right now. Um, American foul brood, you're gonna, and European foul brood, you're, you would be using teramycin, which you need a vet prescription for. And if you have either of these two pathogens in your, um, in your hives, you would need to contact a veterinarian there is to get that prescription, and then you can get teramycin from Man Lake. Um, small hive beetle, uh, kumafos or checkmite would be a chemical uh, that you would use. But again, we have so many other methods to trap and kill hive beetles. I would absolutely avoid using those, those chemicals. And then wax moth, uh, paramoth is not legal in California. Um, let me see. Okay, I'm just gonna get through these quick. Um, so these are some of the pesticides that were identified, found within uh, probably the, whack, the, the comb of hives in, in a study in 2007. Pesticides, these are all pesticides. So it's a bit scary. Um, so we try to avoid using pesticides as much as possible, um, but this is a bit frightening. Um, so we always want to follow label instructions, correct dosage, correct strength, appropriate time of the season. Some of these um, pesticides are not, or the, for the mites, we can't use when it's over like 85 degrees. So you need to make sure that you're using it at the appropriate time of this, of the appropriate temperature or you're, you're going to have major problems. And whether you can use it when the honey supers are on, that's something you need to look at. Um, and then you need to check both before and after to make sure that your treatment worked. And definitely try to rotate or combine your treatments to avoid resistance. So we don't always want to use Formic only. We don't always want to use Apigard only. We want to rotate our treatments. Okay, I'm going to stop there, Wendy. And That's excellent. Break. Yeah, great, great, great. So it's currently 224. Let us return here at 2. 35. Sound great? Good. Thank you. Stands and, um, you know, the way that uh, different types of, of uh, hive covers. This is, I, I took this picture this morning. My yard is terribly weedy and dead right now, so it doesn't look super pretty. Um, but here, these are my hive stands. Um, I've got four cinder blocks on each side and then two four by fours. The reason why I have mine like this is because I have hive scales on each hive stand has one hive with a hive scale on it. So I have to have them set up a certain way. Um, and then from July to sometime in the end of September, I put shade sails up over my hive because it's unbearably hot and difficult to work. Uh, any time of the day standing out in that sun. But my hives have the, my, the telescoping um, covers with the metal on the top, and so they do tend to get hot. So I put the shade cells up. I've got screened bottom boards on all, on all these hives, and I've removed the plastic um, observation tray. I have to have my hives uh, behind an electric fence because I do have to worry about bears. So um, I just wanted to quickly show you guys my personal setup. There are more hives in this picture. I just, just, just took a few. No, this is great. Them. And we yeah. appreciate you showing us uh, what those little yellow um, plastic nibs are for actually Yeah, that's holding. for the electric, yeah, that's yeah. for the electric wire. 
Yeah. Um, and when I look at this picture, Amy, I'm noticing one just doesn't look like all the rest, right? Well, this one? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so I run 10 frame uh, equipment and this one uh, is an eight frame, but it's also a flow hive and it doesn't, I don't have the flow frames on it. Um, the reason I have this flow hive is because one of my clients uh, quit beekeeping because he bought a flow hive and then the flow hive got knocked over by a bear and he didn't want to spend more money on an electric fence. So I, I took his, I rescued his bees from the bear and I took his equipment. Uh, well, I paid for it, but <laughs> um, when, so I got this flow hive, but again, I don't have the, the flow frames on. So, so this very pretty flow hive right there. Uh, it's just nice to see the difference. Uh, yeah. So these hives. are all 10 frames. The, yeah. These are, um, uh, this one and the ones that look taller are on the, the uh, hive, the broodminder scales. Yeah, and um, help us discern the difference between a deep and a medium. Okay, so these two boxes are deeps. Mm -hmm. These two boxes are mediums. You'll notice that this is three deeps and this is three deeps. Um, that's not my typical setup, but I had a, um, I did have a laying worker hive this year for the first time ever. And I shook all the bees out and I put that box on top of this hive just so they could use, um, some of the resources that were in here. But normally well, I run two deeps and then like this has a honey super on. These are honey supers up here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. All things above the brood box are, are supers. What yeah. is on top of all of your lids so i live in um my my neighbor janet brisson uh who i adore she calls we live about a half a mile from each other and she calls she says we live in a venturi i don't know if that's a real thing <laughs> but it's i live in a wind canyon uh she calls it a venturi but i get this am amazing breeze every day that I've had some pretty fierce wind gusts in my little canyon. So every hive has a brick on top of it uh, or a giant rock, except for the flow hive, which I guess I just, I can't really put a, a brick on top of that gabled roof. So right. hopefully they're, they're all right. <laughs> no, no, this has been, this is a, a great little trip into your apiary. Thank you for sharing that. I love your setup with how your, um, your cinder blocks and your two by fours create your hive stands for you. It's yeah, that, that seems to work for me. It cost mm. me about forty dollars per stand, um, but that I I prefer the the height of this. Um, but again, you could use four you could use two to four cinder blocks, and that's going to cost you you know four to five dollars. So, right. um, but I do like this setup a lot. So. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, we're done with all the the anatomy and the the IPM. We're going to move on to um, to splitting and combining hives here. Let me get let me go out. Hold on one one moment here. Wanna, there. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about splitting and combining hives. Um, now, splitting and combining is something you're likely to do. Um, you know, your second year of beekeeping more likely than your first. Um, although combining you may have to do at the, in the, towards the end of the summer if you have a weak hive. So uh, why would you split your hive? So splitting hives, uh, the main thing that it does is, is prevent swarming, um, but it also grows your operation. So Randy Oliver said uh, one time to me that every good beekeeper doubles their surviving hives uh, in the spring. So if you're starting out with two hives and your plan is to just have two hives, at some point you're gonna have four hives. So you have to figure out what to do with those hives if you don't wanna keep them. Um, because you should be doubling your, your hives every year. Um, now, the other reason to split would be to share good genetics. Now, if you're nursing a colony along that has a high mite count every time you do an alcohol wash and you're having to treat with 
you know, formic and, and thymol. And every time you do a wash there after, before a treatment, they have, you know, 25 mites. I'm not really sure that I would um, consider that good genetics. So I wouldn't split that hive necessarily, or if I did, I would introduce some new genetics. But if you have a hive that consistently has a low mite count, I would definitely consider splitting that hive and keeping the genetics of that hive. Um, when you split a colony, you break the brood cycle. So that can assist in reducing your mite count. Um, it also keeps your colonies uh, manageable, a more manageable size. You know, if, if you just continually add room instead of splitting them, you're gonna end up with like three or four deeps of bees in, in August, and that sounds kind of unpleasant. Um, splitting can, can reduce the amount of honey that you get. So you just wanna be aware that, uh, you know, if your goal is honey, um, then you might wanna uh, make nukes instead of splits. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit about that. But, um, and if you make nukes, you can sell them to other people. So that is why you would uh, split or make nukes out of your hive. So a walkaway split is a pretty common way to make a split. And what you're gonna do in a walkaway is you're gonna basically take your two deep boxes and make them into two colonies and we'll walk away. One half is gonna have the queen in it, the other half isn't. But before you do that, you need to make sure that there's eggs in both halves <laughs> um, if you're gonna let the hive requeen itself because if you end up with your queen um, in one box and the other box has no eggs in it, then they're not going to be able to make another queen. So you do, it, it's not quite as, quite as simple as just splitting it and walking away, but um, you need to do that during a uh, swarm season. If you do that when there's no drones um, or <laughs> there's no forage, um, your queen isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to be able to mate. So there is a timing involved in this and there's the potential that it won't work, that you're, they won't make a new queen or the queen doesn't mate or fails to mate or flies out and gets snagged by a scrub jay, you know, there's a potential that it won't work. Uh, when you split your hive this way, there's a potential that you won't have a very high honey production because you're dividing the, the hive in half. Um, you know, it may lower your varroa levels by breaking the brood cycle, um, but this is the easiest way to, to uh, do a split. The other way to do, one of the other ways to do a split is to split with queen cells. So if you're lucky enough to be able to get queen cells in the spring, um, you can split your colony into two equal halves, making sure that the queen is in one half and you put the queen cells from, that you've purchased in the queenless half. Again, there's a potential that this won't work, that the, you know, the queen may not hatch out or whatever happens. Um, you are going to lower your production, but it's going to be it's going to be a quicker uh, quicker end point than just doing a walk away because you're starting out with a, with a queen cell that's capped. Um, again, that break in brood cycle um, could reduce your varroa levels. Uh, you do have to find the queen if you're going to add queen cells, so that that can be tricky in a larger colony. Uh, again, same thing. You can do the same thing with the virgin queen. So you're going to split them. Make sure you know where the queen is. In the, the half that doesn't have a queen, you're going to wait 24 hours and then put a virgin queen in. In a few days, she'll fly out. Same issues as the last two things, you know. Um, there's the potential that it won't work. And then, again, you can split with a mated queen. So... Um, Make sure you know where the queen is. <laughs> Leave the queen or the, the split that doesn't have a queen for, for 24 to 48 hours. And then you're going to install that mated queen into the, the queenless half. And uh, you're going to have to look through your hive a bit deeper to do this because you're going to take mostly capped brood into the split where the new mated queen will be installed. So this is, you know, this is a uh, minimal potential for requeen failure because uh, you're installing a mated queen. There's no drop in production. Um, you can do this later on in the season, and, but you won't get any varroa mite reduction. Now, the problem with this is, I don't know how many of you have tried to get a queen um, like in April or May from a queen producer, but it can be kind of hard. 
unless you know someone who's doing it locally, um, you're not going to get a, a mated queen from like Oliveras in April. So you need to know someone locally who's making queens or make your own queens. Um, and you do have to find the queen in your original hive. So th these are some handy diagrams <laughs> in case you aren't, are having trouble picturing this. So you've got your two deep hive. You're literally going to divide it in half and one ha half is going to have a queen and one half isn't and they'll make their own queen as long as you supply them with eggs. Um, you could also take your two deeps and divide them in half. Your queen is gonna go down in the, in the uh, bottom, uh, the smaller hive and then you can add a, a super or another deep to your split, um, which you would leave behind in the original spot and that would have more, more bees in it, so you would add another box for that. Um, you can get a mated queen, and so this is kind of more like uh, what I would do in the spring, is I divide it in half if I was gonna do a split. I divide it in half, get a mated queen for the other half, and then add my second box because you're gonna not going to have a drop in production at all if you do it this way. So you're going to want to um, give them a second box right away. If you have a three deep in the winter, you would be a lucky person. Um, but you can divide that into three. Now you can divide that into three hives. Now one of them is going to have a queen and two of them aren't. So you're going to have to provide eggs in those two queenless boxes or cells or a queen. Uh, or you can divide one and two. You could divide it into three, um, adding a mated queen to one box and leaving the other box to make uh, their own queen. And now this looks impossible, making three out of four, but if you take frames out, you're basically making a couple of nukes, which is like dividing the top box into, you're splitting the top box in half, basically. Um, now each of those boxes needs a queen or eggs. So there's, as you can see, there's endless combinations. <laughs> there's endless ways to do things. Um, things to consider when splitting. The time of year is vitally important. You can't just do this in September. It's not going to work. You have to do it in the spring. You have to do it during swarm season. You have to do it when there's drones available. Um, I shouldn't say you have to do it when there's drones available. You have to do it uh, in a time of increase, in a time when the bees are naturally inclined to increase, not in a time of decrease. Um, if there's queens available, great, you can do it later in the season. If there's no queens available and you're relying on the bees to make their own queens, there has to be drones available. The weather has to be good enough for the queens to fly out and mate. Is this cost effective? I mean, are you going to if you're able to purchase queens, is that cost effective for you? Queens can be anywhere from $25 to $40 a bottom of it. Um, plus the cost of all the equipment that you're gonna have to buy. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Uh, where are you gonna put all these hives? Are you willing to have you know, more than what you have already? Are you allowed by law to have more than what you have already? And then what is your goal in beekeeping? Is your goal to, to make honey? If so, then I wouldn't necessarily split because you are gonna see a decrease in production. Um, I would consider making a nuke instead of splitting because you'll retain, in that original hive, you'll retain more of your forager population. So um, if your goal is to have more hives and not so much honey, then go ahead and split. But if your goal is to have more honey, then I would make a nuke instead. So these are all really, you know, important things to consider. Um, the, but what's not, what's not on here is, is uh, time, not time of year, but time, how much time do you have? You know, at what point does, does a hobby become uh, overwhelming or potentially like more like a job? Like how many hives are manageable for you? So my, my top number is 20 because I also manage other people's hives and I work as a vet tech and I homeschool my kids. So, you know, 20 is like my max. So figure out what your max is. You don't, you know, 
And, and next year, since I'm, I'm maxed out now, I'm going to have a problem next year. So if anybody wants to buy a nuke, uh, I'll probably have some available um, next April. So uh, there you go. So the catch-22 of splitting. Um, you can't allow your colonies to swarm if you're planning on splitting, because then you're not going to be able to split them. So you have to stay on top of them. Um, you have to do hive inspections probably every seven days in the spring so that you can watch for signs of swarming and prevent that from happening. Um, also equipment, it's expensive. It gets expensive. My first pound of honey cost $800. Um, I'm sure you can all relate to that. So uh, how much do you want to spend? And then, you know, what's the hive density of your apiary? Like, do you really want to have that many hives? What's the, the um, what's your forage like in your neighborhood? Like how, how many hives can your yard support? Um, splitting is free bees, but do you really want those free bees? I mean, so there's all these things to consider. Um, you may not legally al be allowed to have eight colonies in your yard, and um, so that could be a problem. Um, but we want to keep our colonies, you know, manageable. So, we, you know, we, we kind of have to, this is, this is the catch-22 of, of being a beekeeper, is you have to do something about your, your hives every spring. You have to, to manage this swarm impulse and um, split them or make nukes. So if we're gonna make a split and we're gonna add um, new queens to it, how do we do that? So let's imagine that we've made a split and one of our, you know, one of our new hives doesn't have a queen in it. Um, and we want to leave that for 24 hours because if we just make the split and throw a queen in there, the bees are going to immediately attack her because she is not their queen. We have to let them realize that they don't have a queen and then they will be uh, readily accepting of a new queen that we put in. So when we go back after 24 hours to add a new queen, we want to take a quick look for any queen cells that they may have already made within that 24 to 48 hours because they will. They will make one quite quickly. Um, so this, um, the, so I'm, I'm speaking sort of for Bernardo in his uh, queen installation method, which is highly uh, successful for him. He uses a lot of sugar water and he sprays that on everything. And that, and I know a lot of people do that and it, it totally works because um, the bees just, they lick the sugar water off of everything, including that new queen and they, um, are more likely to accept her. So we're gonna watch a little video, I think, of him doing it, but. Um, so what, what we do, or what Bernardo does, and lots of people do, is they, they cage the new queen, or, or they, per, you know, you get, you get a queen from a queen, bre queen breeder, and it comes in a little plastic or wooden cage. Um, and we wanna make sure that the, the cork is, uh, that there's some kind of cork or wax or sugar plug or whatever in that, in that hole. Um, we want her to stay in that cage for a few days. Um, I use those little candy plugs, I think they're great, but I've used wax in a pinch. So you're gonna spray down the, that, that queen cage with sugar water. And then you're gonna spray the workers with sugar too. And the sugar water is, you know, it's a, it's probably like, I, I take the, the one to one syrup and I would put a, like, I would fill a spray bottle, like maybe one quarter of the way with the, the syrup. And then I'd add water um, to that, to make that sugar syrup. So it's just, you know, it's just sugar water basically, like hummingbird food. Then you're gonna install that queen. Remember this is 24 to 48 hours after you've removed the old queen, so they've been queenless for a day or two. You're gonna install the queen between the two frames of, of captor emerging brood. So she's gonna be in the middle of the, the new box or the, the new hive. Okay, so here's the, the video. So he's gonna, he's taking the queen out of the box that she, the wooden box. Um, he, I guess he likes the plastic cages better. He's gonna take her out and mark her.
So you're putting her down on the frame. And he's marking her with a pen, a paint pen. And then he's putting her into the little plastic cage. Now he's going to um, cap that plastic cage with a little bit of tissue. Again, you can use whatever you have. Now he's spraying her down with uh, sugar water and he's spraying the workers with sugar water. And he's just putting her right in between those two frames and squeezing them together so that the cage doesn't fall. That's it. That's all there is to it. Um, okay, so moving on. Um, we're going to talk about combining colonies. <clears throat> this is something that uh, you can do, there's lots of different times of the year where, where, when you can um, combine and reasons for combining. I, I, like I mentioned, I combined that, uh, some of that laying worker hive with a strong, uh, a strong colony. And I did that a couple weeks ago. Um, but it's something I would more likely do uh, later in the, in the summer. Um, if I had a hive that was weak that I didn't think was gonna, were gonna make it through the winter, I might um, combine them with a stronger colony. So that, that's what it means by equalizing for overwintering. So I would combine, or I could combine two weak colonies into a strong colony um, to save that, those two weak colonies and make them you know, stronger with a bigger population. Or if I have a hive that uh, loses a queen and I can't replace her, or, and they try to make another one and it's just not working and I don't wanna go and buy another queen, so I just combine that hive with another hive. Um, if you keep, keep your apiary free of weak colonies by combines, um, then there will, you know, the colonies that get robbed in the late summer are the weak ones. So we don't want our colonies to be weak. So, you know, robbing is a problem throughout, throughout uh, late summer and, and fall. So that would be a good time to combine a weak col a colony. And this also makes it a little bit easier to manage because it lowers the amount of hives that you have. And it, so in the spring, we have less hives that we have to split. So, you know, as, as much as I enjoy having 20, uh, 20 hives, I'm sort of dreading next spring. So uh, I might end up combining some of my colonies towards the end of the summer so that in the spring, I don't have to try to um, sell 20 nukes. So we're only combining a queenless colony with a queen right colony. But if say we have two weak colonies that both have queens, I'm gonna pick one of those queens to uh, dispatch. And then I'm gonna wait 24, 48 hours, and then I'm gonna combine those two hives. Uh, obviously, we don't want to combine two colonies that have queens because they're going to fight, and and the worst case situation is that both of them would die, and then we'd have two colonies with no queens. So, yeah, we want to remove the queen from the weakest colony, and then what we do is we place a sheet of newspaper in between the two uh, deep boxes. And I've seen different methods. Um, I've kind of made a slit with a hive tool just to get them started on chewing up the newspaper, or you can spray um, both colonies down with sugar water. You can not cut slits, you can use tissue paper, you can use almost any kind of thin paper that you have on hand. I always have tissue paper on hand, so I just use that. Um, and then after a couple of days, the bees will chew through the paper and they will by that time be used to each other's scent and be used to the queen scent and they they should be all right now I've had to I tried to combine a colony once in the winter and that just did not work so um, I, I feel like this is a thing that should be done in the spring uh, summer and fall but it might be a little more challenging in the winter So you're going to take your two colonies, one has a queen and one doesn't, I'm literally just going to stack the, the boxes together with a newspaper in between. Okay, so let me go, I jumped around on this presentation, so let me go back to where we should be. 
Uh, actually, Wendy, this is a good time to pause. And is there any questions I need to address? Yeah, thank you for checking in. There are. Uh, okay. Karine asks, please provide more detail on cutting the slits. Is this the length of every space between the frames or only a few oh. inch long slits? Yeah, yeah, I just cut like a couple, like maybe like one, you know, three inch, three to four inch slit. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, I'm sure everyone does it, you know, a different way, but I don't think it, it really matters that much. I just cut like one little slit yep. just to get them started. Yep. Yeah. And then when combining the colonies, which box should have the remaining queen? Uh, top or the bottom if there's equal so, brood? You know, um, if you ask a beekeeper a question, or if you ask 10 beekeepers that question, you'll get 10 different answers. I don't think that it is that important, to be honest. Some people will say, absolutely, your queen should be on the top. I've done it both ways. It works both ways. Yeah, yeah. And, and we also uh, have some comments, you know, like, um, I lightly sift sugar each time I'm about to close up the hives in the hopes of enticing the bees to become more interested in grooming each other and possibly train them to be more hygienic. Maybe I should use sugar water instead. Or do you think this is not a good practice? Well, for me, um, I, would, I would avoid that if I were in an area that had a lot of ants. I, I don't want to bring more sugar or more um, attractant for ants. Than, than what they need. And as well, if um, I don't understand enough about genetics to be able to tell you that, yes, we could, you know, quote unquote, train our bees to be more interested in grooming, but who knows, that is possible. And that would be a question that I'll put on the Q&A and go to the experts with. Yeah, I don't know that that, that would transfer as a genetic trait. Right. Um, and if I was going to, if I, if I was going to encourage my, if I wanted to encourage my bees to groom, I would spray um, sugar water, but I wouldn't do that at a, I would only do that certain times of year. So like, I wouldn't want to spray sugar water during a dearth because then you're going to attract other bees. So to, you might incite a robbing incident. So, yeah, um, and moisture in the hives when yeah. it's um, more wintry and very humid, depending yeah, so, on where you're living, right? So I'm not sure that that um, that I would recommend that as a mm -hmm. practice, and I'm not sure that um, the bees would transfer that knowledge genetically. So, um, but like I like I said, I think I said yesterday, I do use sugar water instead of smoke, um, but my I don't live in an area with overly defensive bees, number one. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I live in an extremely high fire risk area. Um, and, I, and I only do it uh, certain times of the year, and I do it when I'm going to be quick. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would be careful about adding sugar in any form. You know, even with the powdered sugar dusting, um, I, I would go through my hives and hose the ground down around because mm -hmm. of the ants. Mm -hmm. So there's a risk to, to doing things like that. So I would just consider the risks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and I'm not the, sure that the benefit is worth the, worth the risk in that. Yeah. Case. Yeah. That, that's, that's a fair point. And one other thing that I've not heard, but um, somebody's read that adding a drop of vanilla to the sugar water helps to mask the residual pheromones. I've not heard of that approach, Amy. Have you? Residual pheromones from what? Yeah, I don't know. I yeah, don't know. I don't know either. The yeah. only additive that I know um, that's quite commonly used, I was talking to Ashley about that, is uh, Honey Be Healthy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, again, I'm not sure, like I don't want to promote uh, things that aren't scientifically uh, valid, but anecdotally, and I'm going to say that anecdotally, um, the Honey Be Healthy additive can be useful in a lot of different situations. Yeah. So um, that's the only additive that I'm okay with adding. I'm not, the other additive that I would consider is sometimes in the sugar water I spray, uh, I would put mint or something in there, but that's again about masking pheromones um, in the hive. So maybe that that's what they're referring to. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I don't know that I would add vanilla because it's not really like, I would use something like mint or rosemary or thyme, something that is out there in the environment anyway. I, I don't know. Right. Is that do what it, the, yeah. Yeah. Do what the bees do more or less. Right. right? Do what the bees do. Yeah. Like bees, yeah. Bees, yeah. If we, if I lived in Madagascar, I might uh -huh. put vanilla in there. Yeah. But I don't. I live in yeah. Grass Valley. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. So, that covers it. So let's move on to the next segment, products of the hive. Okay, so um, this is the last segment of the presentation. And then there's just one thing I want to show everyone uh, that's online before we wrap it up. So let me go through this uh, portion of the presentation. <clears throat> Okay, so we all we all kind of probably know the things that you can get from having uh, a beehive. Obviously, honey is the main one, and then wax, uh, bee venom, royal jelly, pollen, propolis, and bees. And these are all things that uh, can be monetized um, to make your hobby <laughs> a little more affordable, perhaps. So this is the definition of honey, and 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 I think it's something that keep in mind when you're out in the world and explaining things to people. Um, honey is the natural sweet substance produced by honeybees from the nectar of blossoms or from secretions of living parts of plants or excretions of plant sucking insects. That's honeydew also on the living parts of plants, which honeybees collect, transform and combine with specific substances of their own enzymes that they produce store and leave in the honeycomb to ripen and mature. So that's, that's a lot of information, but that's the definition of honey. Um, these are the principal components of honey. If anyone's interested in chemistry, um, we can see that fructose and glucose are the, the highest uh, components, but that water, that 17.5, if you have a refractometer, um, I got a refractometer from Amazon for like 20 bucks. If you're at all planning on harvesting honey, I would recommend getting one just to make sure your, your uh, water percentage is right. Otherwise you'll end up with some, some boozy honey. So honey can be talked about just the same way that wine can be talked about. And um, if you have the chance to attend one of uh, Amina Harris's presentations on honey tasting at Oh, like I guess virtual but not or potentially in the future live there's also that fantastic honey wheel that they came up with um, that helps people to identify and talk about honey uh, I mean it does a great 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 job of explaining all this but we talk about honey the same way we talk about wine um, there's a color component a flavor component and an aroma component um, the color is based on the the main type of plant pigments and nectar components that are in the honey. Um, honey can range from like almost clear white to all to like dark thick black um, depending on the the varietal. Um, the flavor depends on again the nectar and other plant compounds and the main varietal that's in that that honey or the mixture of the varietals. Um, the aroma is based on the chemical composition so the alcohols, the key ketones, the aldehydes, and the esters that are in the honey. So there's different, even different forms of honey. There's liquid honey um, that requires an extractor, or if, you're, if you have a flow hive, you know, it just magically pours out. Um, it can go, it can crystallize, which is a natural process, and, and actually um, in Europe, they prefer crystallized honey because it's easier to spread. So a lot of the honey that you pick up if you go overseas will be crystallized. Um, and then comb honey. Uh, if you're gonna, if you're interested in producing comb honey, you need a special type of comb super, which are readily available. You can get them at Man Lake. You can order them on the internet. Um, they, you can see a picture of it here. It's the, it, these special uh, foundationless frames with these little cassettes. Um, or you can, if you're using a top bar or a foundationless frame, um, you can harvest comb honey that way. 
And often, like, if you're going to sell comb honey, you would portion it out into those little plastic uh, boxes or you can put it in mason jars and then you're going to backfill it with the liquid honey that you extract. Okay, um, this is a video, and I'm, you're going to have to bear with me for a moment while I fast forward uh, through parts of it. But this is a video of how to extract honey with an uh, extractor. And I'm going to take my mic. So, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> Ads. I don't care about nail fungus. Okay, so I'm gonna fast forward through part of this. We're gonna get to the honey extracting with the honey extractor. It goes into that bucket, and that's the capping tub where we cut off the wax capping. About ready to begin. All right, so this is one of our frames actually where the wax cappings are a little bit outside the edge of this wood frame. They're built a little bit out, which is ideally what we will get to um, next year when they build it out a little more. And so it makes it a lot easier to use to extract it with a heated knife, which is what this is. So this is, you can see it's kind of bubbling the honey that's on there. So what you do, you ready with this, yours? So you kind of just set it on the edge. And you can slide it all the way up and it just takes those wax cappings. You can tell it's a little bit uneven. Just takes the wax cappings off the outside and that falls down into the bucket. There is some honey that falls with it. Um, but that will actually go through this um, filter and come out the bottom. So we can actually extract this honey out as well. But the hot knife just kind of slices right through, takes the caps off the outside. It's almost like when it gets near this, the top that it doesn't do as well. So that took most of the wax off. When the honey starts to drip out, we'll do the back side now, which is a little bit further in. We have to use a different tool for that. This sometimes will work a little bit. Oh, this actually is working. We'll get a little bit of the wax cappings off. He's starting to dig it again. Is it still on? Yeah. So use that as much as we can, and then we have this little comb that you use to kind of just go under and pry it off a little bit. So this is starting to talk. Very sticky business. The honey's been extracted out. We'll do back of this just for a minute. So we're going to finish just this last little piece, and then this frame is ready to go in the extractor. And what's fabulous is really good. <laughs>
Okay. So that's the process of honey extracting. I just lost my presentation here. Um, some things to mention about that. Um, when you're adding, when you're putting your honey super on top of your deep brood chambers, um, when you buy your honey super, it comes with 10, or it, ha it has space for, for either 10 or eight frames, depending on what you're using. If you're using a 10 frame uh, setup, then you might want to consider uh, putting nine frames in your honey super instead of 10. If you space them out correctly, and you can actually buy um, little metal strip uh, spacers to make your 10 frame into a nine frame. And what that does is the bees build the frames out uh, beyond the edge of the frame. Uh, they'll build the comb out. So when you use that hot knife, it's really easy uh, to, to take the cap off because the comb extends out beyond the, the frame, if that makes any sense. Um, it's a lot easier to uncap if the frame, if the comb has extended out beyond the frame. Um, and you actually get just the same amount of honey as you would with that, with that 10th frame in there. Um, so the same thing goes for an eight frame. You would use seven frames instead of eight in your supers. Um, so, so that's one way to extract honey. If you have access to an extractor, um, a lot of clubs uh, will have an extractor for club use. So I would check with your local association. Um, I'm lucky that in Grass Valley, the beekeeping store has a honey shed for us to use. Um, sometimes club members will have a honey shed that they allow, to allow other members to use. So, you know, in your first couple of years of beekeeping, you're not gonna get that much honey. So I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily recommend buying an extractor um, until you've been doing this a few years. Also, um, like at, at the beekeeping store in Grass Valley where I live, they have a honey shed and the shed is heated. So I bring my honey in there the night before and they turn on a heater and when I go to in there the next day to harvest my honey, it's like 95 degrees in there. And it makes it really nice. Uh, well, kind of actually horrible and nice because it's really super hot in there, but also the honey flows a lot better. So um, that's something to consider if you're thinking about um, harvesting a lot of honey at some point is it's nice to have like a dedicated space for this activity because it's nice to be able to heat it and it's also terribly difficult to clean up after yourself. Uh, so it's nice to have that dedicated space. Now the other way to um, harvest honey is called crush and strain. Now when I click on this, I'm afraid we're gonna get hit with a bunch of ads and I'm also afraid it's gonna not be the same video that I, that I linked, so let's find out. So just bear with me here. I'll mute the ads for you. Ah, yes. This is the right. Keeping is like the ocean. You turn your back on your bees, and you could be in for a big. Last night, I went to go check on them, and I lifted up the roof on the blue hive, and this is what I found. Basically, wild comb. Regrettably, I had to cut down all of this comb, but fortunately, I can use the beeswax and the honey in my beauty products. Check out lovelygreens-shop.com for those. But, as you can see inside my hive, I had another dilemma. In the place that I'd forgotten to put in the last frame, they had actually built a perfect wedge of beeswax, honeycomb essentially, and it was completely filled with honey for the most part. It just looked exactly like the comb should look if you had a frame in there, but I had to take it out. So I used my hive tool and pried it out. I gave a piece to a friend of mine who was at the allotment at the time, and then I bundled the rest of it back home.
Once I got the honeycomb home, I strained some of the honey off of it using an ordinary kitchen sieve. Now, most of this honey that you see is uncapped honey. That means that it was in the comb, but it didn't have that wax capping over the cell. And this also means that that honey has a bit higher water content in it still. So it might not last as long as honey that has been capped. So the plan was, and is, to put this in a jar and to use it as quickly as possible. To get the rest of the honey out of the comb, I use the crush and strain method, which is one of the easiest techniques for extracting honey. And it is exactly how it sounds. You crush the honeycomb up, you can use a potato masher or a wooden spoon like I've used, and then you strain it through a membrane into another container. Now I've seen this online with various series of buckets and whatnot. It's very simple for smaller quantities like this. You can use an ordinary kitchen strainer, put it over a bowl, use a cheesecloth to make sure that you catch any little bits of beeswax, pour it all in, and then you want to let it sit for a day, even two days, to allow the honey to pass through that filter and into the lower container. While that honey is filtering through, you should probably keep it in a safe place in the kitchen away from windows. Bees will be attracted to the scent of the honey. And then perhaps even put a kitchen towel or even ordinary towel over the top just to make sure that no debris goes in. And then after a day or two, you're left with loads of honey and beeswax to use in projects. Okay, so that's another way to harvest honey is the crush and strain method. Now, the advantages to um, using an extractor, if you have access to one, is that after you've spun out those frames in the extractor, um, you can reuse them. And that's a huge deal because all that comb is still intact. So um, when you go to reuse it next year, the bees don't have to work nearly as hard to draw out all that comb because it's already there. Now the crush and strain works for foundationless, but it also, if you're just uh, trying to harvest a small amount of honey, if you're using foundation frames, you can simply scrape uh, the entire uh, honeycomb off the, the foundation and do what, that, what was shown in the video. So um, those are two methods. If you have access to an extractor and you're doing more than like two or three frames of honey, I highly recommend do, doing it that way, uh, just simply to preserve that comb for next year. So honey is more than just a sweet treat. There are medicinal uses because it has antimicrobial uh, properties. It is actually uh, great for coughs. Um, it can soothe your cough. Um, I'm a, I'm a vet tech, as I mentioned, and um, we, can, we often use it in wound treatment um, for people who have to treat uh, wounds at home for not only animals, but people. Uh, it's antimicrobial, so it aids in, in healing. Um, it has been looked at for treatment for, um, for MRSA. Uh, I think, I guess, I wouldn't know about this, but I guess it's a hangover cure. Um, it can help uh, soothe the pain from ulcers. Um, it can help soothe uh, burns. But, you know, these are mostly sort of anecdotal things. Um, a lot of people, lots and lots of people, uh, swear that honey uh, helps with your allergies. There's, there's really no evidence of that. <laughs> so um, I don't really discourage that myth, but I also, I don't encourage it. Uh, but it's sort of a, uh, might be sort of a placebo effect for a lot of people. But hey, you know, that's great. Works, if it works for your allergies, great. But it, it, there's no, no real scientific basis for that. Um, if you're planning on selling your honey, um, you know, not just to your friends, but to uh, in a farmer's market or a store, there are certain requirements for the labels. Um, you need to, to have a, a name of a nectar source, which can be as simple as wildflower honey. You don't have to um, call, you don't have to actually source the nectar if you're not sure. Just 
call it what I was comprehending. Um, you need to have both the standard and a metric weight units on the label. Uh, pure honey doesn't need a separate ingredient list, but if you're adding additives to it, then you do need to put that on the label. And then um, the country of origin, obviously, and contact information for uh, the beekeeper must be on the label. And if you're planning on doing that, uh, definitely uh, click on that link down there to the regulations for honey labeling. Uh, mead. Mead is the world's oldest alcoholic beverage. It's been around for a very long time and it's produced by fermenting honey with water. Um, and you can add flavors and additives and it's kind of making a resurgence in the last couple of years is that uh, you can buy it, you know, in the grocery store now. Um, and there's lots of courses at the Honey and Pollination Center for, for mead making and mead tasting, uh, really interesting stuff. Wax. Uh, wax is produced by the younger worker bees. There's glands located under the abdomen. We've seen pictures of that today. And wax production is dependent on nectar flow. So uh, more nectar comes in, the more wax they produce and the more comb they build. Uh, production is dependent on need. So if they need more comb, they build it. Uh, pesticides can accumulate in wax. So be aware of that if you're producing wax for, or if you're interested in harvesting wax for cosmetic use. And it's really a, a, a costly uh, resource for them to produce. There's a huge amount of nectar uh, goes into producing wax. So just be aware of that. That's why I like to use the extractor for my, when I extract honey, because I know how much it costs them to build. Uh, here's the composition of wax for any chemists out there. So if you're going to process wax on a, you know, on a, on a hobby level, uh, when you do that on capping, you want to collect that cappings in a capping bin. And then um, you can let the bees clean up the honey or let it drain out like uh, and collect it for yourself, but there's still going to be a lot of honey on it. So you can uh, give that back in a bowl to the bees to clean up the honey and then take the wax and put it in a solar wax melter. Um, I made a solar wax melter out of a deep box and a solid bottom board and I, I, I screwed the deep box to the bottom board and I spray painted the whole inside of it black. And then I put, um, I put the wax in a sieve with a cheesecloth underneath and then underneath that I put a glass dish and then I put on top of that I put a plastic tub lid and I set it outside and that's you know there's an easy way to make a solar wax melter putting it through the solar wax melter pure it kind of clarifies it a bit so all the 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 sludge uh, comes out um, there's lots of plans and ideas online about how to make a solar wax melter, but that's, uh, it's really useful to purif to clarify the wax. Um, wax can be used for candles, foundation, cosmetics, sealant. I've made furniture polishes out of it or, or art. Okay, so, that, so that's um, the uses for wax. And then propolis is something that you can also harvest. Um, like I said a bunch of times, it's a antimicrobial properties um, for the bees. It can be used as like a throat uh, lozenge. Oh, sorry, I'll go back to that. Um, so you need to, to harvest the propolis with a propolis trap, which is what that blue thing is. Um, you lay that on top of your top box under the inner cover if you're using one, and the bees will uh, fill up those holes with propolis. And then you take it off and you put it in the freezer for a little while. And then supposedly if you snap it, all the propolis kind of cracks off. That's not been my experience, but that's the theoretical, uh, that's the theory. This can also be an allergen for humans. So you have to be careful when ingesting it. Here are the, the components, although we don't know the percentages of the, the components. Um, it varies, but those are the main components. And then what we would use it for, because it's antifungal and antimicrobial, you can make it into all kinds of different things, like a salve uh, would be one way to use that topically. Um, I've made a throat spray with it, where I've, uh, I had to let it sit in 
in Everclear for like 30 days and then let that soak in and then it, it makes a nice throat spray for when you have a, a sore throat or a strep throat. There are studies currently about using propolis as an HIV treatment. I'm not going to expound on that because I don't know much about that, but it being potentially antiviral. Um, I know Randy Oliver was involved in that a little bit, but that was several years ago. So they need to, you know, continue working on that. Pollen. Um, if you're interested in collecting pollen, uh, you need to use a pollen trap. Um, there's a couple different types of pollen traps. Um, the danger with pollen traps is that it can actually damage the bees. It's going through the pollen trap. So just be, be mindful of that. You also don't want to collect all their pollen because obviously they need it. So be mindful if you're gonna collect pollen. We know that the worker bees collect the pollen from plants and put it on their pollen baskets. Um, they collect pollen from a wide range of, of sources and they need it. So we don't, we wanna, you know, just take a little bit. Um, here are the components of pollen. Um, and people ingest pollen as a nutritional supplement. Um, there are some studies that hint that it might be a protection against radiation or um, there is an actual study that it's an anti, it helps with chronic prostatitis. Um, so that might be worth looking into, but people generally uh, ingest it as a, uh, an allergy supplement. But I'd, I'd be pretty careful doing that um, because you're ingesting a large amount of the thing you're allergic to, potentially. So just be careful. But it is used as a nutritional supplement. Uh, honeybee venom. So we know that the venom is stored in the poison sac of both workers and queens, and it's a complex blend of compounds. Um, it can cause you know, local reactions, systemic reactions, uh, which would be anaphylactic shock. And uh, people harvest this for different reasons, um, but it's harvested from live worker honeybees. Um, let's take a, a side moment here to talk about uh, stings, and local reactions. So local reactions are characterized by pain, swelling, redness, itching, and a wheel surrounding the sting. So a big red swollen uh, circle. Um, sometimes the swelling can be pretty severe, like, like this guy. It's pretty bad. Um, the normal swell, swelling can last a few days. Mine typically lasts about 48 hours, and it can be really itchy. Um, the swelling can be alleviated by icing and taking some Benadryl, and you can use topical Benadryl or calamine, and you want to drink plenty of water. Possible to have a severe allergic reaction that is not life threatening, which is a systemic reaction. Again, not anaphylaxic, but systemic. But this still can uh, be alarming, and you need to seek medical care if you have a systemic reaction that causes um, all kinds of, of problems. Um, and then, but then anaphylaxis is different from a systemic reaction. Again, if you're if you have an anaphylactic reaction, you would absolutely need to. Uh, seek medical help immediately. Um, as the beekeeper, I told my doctor that I was a beekeeper and she gave me a, a prescription for an EpiPen and I'm able to get uh, four EpiPens every two years for free. So if you're not sure, if you're allergic, if you haven't been stung that many times, um, might be a good idea to have an EpiPen. And even so, like even I've been stung once a week for four years, I could still develop anaphylaxis. In fact, um, one of the reasons that they harvest honeybee venom is to use an allergy desensitization. Um, and I'm really super lucky because my dog uh, had an anaphylactic reaction to a bee sting in my car when I was working in Napa. So I'm super like lucky because I'm a beekeeper and a vet tech and my dog is allergic to bees. So he's getting uh, allergy desensitization once a week right now. So that would be, uh, so I'm very grateful to the people out there who are harvesting honeybee venom for my dog. Um, so let's go back. Um, melatonin is the principal component of honeybee venom. 
and then you can see the other the other components here but um, it's a peptide and it stimulates cortisol, which acts as an anti-inflammatory, interestingly. There's other anti-inflammatory compounds in bee venom, and that's why um, it might ease the symptoms of arthritis and tendonitis and fibromyalgia. Um, again, it's used in allergy desensitization. There's not a lot of controlled studies. There's, again, a lot of anecdotal uh, information out there about uh, bee venom being uh, good for certain types of illnesses. And if you're interested, uh, apatherapy.org would be a place for you to learn more about that. Royal jelly. Um, these are, royal jelly is the secretion from the hypopharyngeal glands and manibular glands of young worker bees. And again, we talked about this, but it's fed to all female larvae for the first three days of life. And it's fed to the queen larva until it's uh, pupated, until it pupates. And they harvest this from queenless colonies. So, you know, they're getting the bees to make queens and they're harvesting the royal jelly before the cap is, uh, the cell is capped. Here are the principal components of royal jelly. It's like mostly water and carbs and protein. Uh, royal jelly uses. Uh, royal jelly is popular in Chinese medicine, uh, apparently for hair loss, fatigue, asthma, impotence, and anxiety. Um, it's used in, as moisturizers, like facial moisturizers, uh, primarily in Asia. It does have some antimicrobial properties. Um, there aren't a lot of good controlled studies on, on whether this is actually beneficial for anything, but um, we also use royal jelly when we're grafting. So that would be another reason to harvest it. And then honeybees. Um, if you're interested in queen rearing, that's a really uh, good way to make a profit off your hobby or go into a business. Uh, if you have good quality queens and skills of grafting, um, you can make a good deal of money at queen rearing. Um, it's a very specialized skill. So, and then, you know, selling packages and nukes and pollination services. These are ways to monetize um, honeybees. So tips for selling your products. You need to follow all the local rules and regulations and the state rules and regulations. Um, if you're gonna sell honey to, you know, in a commercial setting, it's good if you have it all the time and not just uh, certain times of year. So you'd wanna be able to have enough of a steady supply to supply a quality product. And use words like local, um, natural, and pure on your label. Um, don't heat the honey past 120 uh, Fahrenheit. Um, provide free samples, those little honey sticks are great. Um, and then you can also mix honey with fruit or nuts, but then that, that has different regulations. And get a nice label. Um, get someone, a graphic designer to make you a nice label. If you're interested in selling honey, definitely look at the National Honey Board, the American Honey Producers Association, and the California State Beekeeper Association for more information about prices and um, regulations and laws and other things. And I'm gonna pause there for questions, Wendy, and then I have one more thing I wanna add. Great, thank you, thank you so much. I'm looking at the chat. Um, have a question for uh, well, actually, just a lot of talk about uh, epipens and stuff, basically. Okay. Um, so thanks to Gina and Ashley and Kathy and Leah for helping us with that. Um, and after extraction, how do you uh, deal with uh, your wets, your wet frames? So I would put um, them back on the hive yeah. for a couple of days. Um, I don't like leave them out in the yard. I, I put them back on the hive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and close up the hive so that I don't in invite robbers to come. Yeah, and it's also illegal to uh, commonly feed bees right. in the state it's, of California. Yeah, yeah so. it's illegal to open feed honey, so you, yeah. you wouldn't want to do that anyway. Correct. Um, and then, yeah, so I'd put the the wet frames back on the hive, and then um, after a couple of days, I'd go back and take them off, and then I I just store them 
in a shed because they haven't had brood in them, I can store them in a shed and mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about wax moth. But when I store them, I put, um, I put them up off the ground and then I put queen excluders in between them to keep mice out. Yes, great idea. And Alina spoke a couple of weeks ago about actually latticing frames uh, to prevent wax moth from invading as well. Yeah, uh, so if you've had brood in, in your drawn comb, you need to store it differently. But yeah, um, yeah. you don't have to worry about wax moth if there's not been brood in it. So if you've had brood, you need to store it, lat like lattice it or store it out in the light and the air. Right. And I was hoping that you could also do a quick run through uh, for uh, folks who uh, are interested in learning about where are the optimal places to keep your apiary? What do you, what, what is the quintessential place to put beehives? Like I'm thinking lots of forage, right? Uh, yeah, forage, water, um, you know, there's lots of, there's advantages to having your hives in an urban or suburban area um, because you're going to have a lot more uh, irrigation and landscaping. So like my hives, I showed you that picture. You can see everything is dry. Um, mm -hmm. I have three apiaries. I have one in Grass Valley and in my, at my house, there is, we don't have uh, any irrigation district at my house. So we don't have a lot of people irrigating or keeping um, cows or sheep or livestock that need constant irrigation. So um, I don't get a lot of honey from my yard in Grass Valley, but then I have a, a yard in Newcastle in an area that gets lots and lots of irrigation. So there's lots of um, clover coming up all the time and there's lots more year round forage. So I think irrigation, um, if you're in a rural area, irrigation is key. Um, if you're in a not a rural area, then I think you're probably a bit, can potentially be better off because you have more, like I said, landscaping and irrigation year round. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And also we've got a question uh, regarding, she's, uh, Leanne has a, a two deep and one super. And uh, most of the capped honey is in the middle box, which is a deep. And she liked to be able to extract the honey as they've only filled one frame so far in the super. So is there a way to be able to extract the honey? Well, your bees need a certain amount of honey to get through the winter, and that is uh, location dependent. So um, you, depending on where you are in California, you may or may not need be able to extract that honey. That might be the bees' honey. So you would, I would ask some local um, beekeepers how much honey that your bees need to get through the winter in your area. Yeah, but excellent answer. Uh, Ray is asking a great question too about bees in urban settings regarding how problematic is the use of pesticides and plant supplements used by residents? Yeah, uh, it, it can be risky and problematic mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Like if people are using pesticides, um, that's just one of the risks you're going to be taking in an urban area. There's not much you can do about it except educate your neighbors um, and educate your community about the risks of using pesticides. Mm. So it can, yeah. it can be definitely an issue. And I've had, I've had clients lose entire hives mm -hmm. because of pesticide use. So it, it can be a problem for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so that seems so, to be all of the uh, questions. So let me take um, a minute to share a resource with you guys. And I did want to add something about, um, about putting honey supers on. So I'm gonna go back to, let me just pull this up before I share my screen. So 
I've mentioned Randy Oliver several times in the last couple of days. And if you're, if you don't know who he is, um, he, let me go back to sharing the screen. He is a beekeeper in Grass Valley. Um, he's very well known throughout the beekeeping community. He writes for all the beekeeping journals. He's, he does a lot of experiments and um, he's just very, very, very knowledgeable and a very good source of information. He has this website called scientificbeekeeping.com and I highly, highly recommend, I refer to this constantly, just scroll down to this beginners pages and then this section called first year beekeeping. I um, have this saved as a PDF on my phone because I constantly refer to this, um, this page. It's, it, as you can see, it's a lot of information, but it's well worth reading. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's kind of um, specific to the foothills, but it can be applied to most places in California. And someone had asked about a calendar um, yesterday. So this is some of the, some, some of the sorts of information that Randy has on his website, like this, this sort of colony progression and when to treat for varroa and when to feed and when to harvest honey. And if you haven't, uh, looked at this at all, I seriously spend some time reading this. Um, there's some other, let me scroll down here. There, he has a, okay, so this is a little thing about the plants that are blooming in the foothills during, in a calendar for that. Um, some great pictures of food frames, what to look for different times of year. And then what I also really want to share with you, we talked a little bit about using queen excluders and, um, how to use queen excluders so that they don't become honey excluders. So I'm just trying to find this little diagram uh, that Randy uses to explain how to use queen excluders. Oh, he also has a link. So if, if you weren't here yesterday, this is a, a how do you do an alcohol wash. So all that information is here. And here he has a guide to um, the different treatments and the different time of year that it's appropriate to use those treatments. Again, oxalic is not legal in California yet, but he has a guide to all the different treatments, how to use them. So just a ton of information on here. And I think I skipped it, but somewhere in here is he talks about how to uh, use a honey super or how to use a queen excluder. So look for that while you're perusing all this information. Thanks, Amy. And uh, we'll include scientificbeekeeping.com in the notes that we send out so folks don't have to scramble to write it down. I have another question that I missed. Sorry, Michelle. Um, how far does the new split need to be placed from the original hive? Somebody told Michelle that she didn't have enough space to do a split, so. Yeah, um, so when I make a split, I, I usually take the split with the queen in it and I move that. And I can move that three feet away. This gets a bit tricky. So if, if, I, don't, if I don't find the queen and I want to make a split, I can't find the queen, and I take, um, or I take the, the, the half that, that doesn't have a queen in it, if I'm going to move that, I'm going to have to move it to a different location. Because if I move the half that doesn't have a queen in it two feet away, they're all gonna fly back into the old location because there's no queen. So the easiest thing to do if you don't have a lot of space is when you make your split, you leave your queenless 
hive in the same location and you move your queen right hive two, three, four, or five feet away, it doesn't matter. Those bees are gonna stay with the queen. The foragers are gonna return to the old hive and whoever is left in there is gonna stay there. Does that make sense? I'm making an artificial swarm, basically. Mm -hmm. Artificial swarms work for me and because I have a I have to keep all my hives in a in a in behind the bare fence. I don't have a lot of space either. So if I'm going to keep them at my in my um, apiary, I do an artificial swarm. Yeah, sh um, thumbs up to the answer. And I would also like Leah, if you're available, to chime in on this because there are specific ordinances in Southern California regarding how many colonies or what the distance is uh, between uh, hives. Uh, in some cases, uh, well, Leah, Leah could fill us in on that. Go for it. Oh, where to start? That's yeah, the I know. There's a lot. There's, yeah, so, so if this does happen to you, if you are um, experiencing a large volume, uh, make sure to look at your local ordinances, of course, start with your city and then your county ordinance and then finally into this, what the state recommends. But specifically for an example in San Diego County, if you live in the city, if you have one or two hives, you can have them basically 10 feet from anywhere, your neighbor's property. And um, if you step into three or more, so if you, your colony is about to swarm and you make a split, now you have three instead of two, you have to be 600 feet, so two football fields away from your nearest neighbor, which makes it um, almost impossible to keep bees in that urban city environment. I hope that clarifies, Wendy. Yes, absolutely. It just it's a it's another insight into the importance of um, knowing what your local rules and ordinances are, especially when we're splitting or anticipating splitting. And based on what Amy was talking about earlier, twenty hives is her max. Even that is a little over, right? So, um, Amy does have between her two yards the space. But if I were in Southern California, um, when I got my hive, I would have to, I would want to know if I have room for two hives, right? More than just one. So um, that's something to consider for sure. Thank you, Leah. And thank you, Amy. Um, I'm just quickly reviewing again the chat. It appears as though we have answered all of the questions. Um, and I'd, I'd like to let everybody know that this week, as I mentioned at the top, we will be sending out our copies of the recordings from the weekend. And we'll also be sending out the PDF uh, that Amy shared and all of the, the Q and A's that we cultivated during our time together because we're learning together. So it's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to learn with you, with Amy, with Leah, and we certainly look forward to uh, getting together again uh, soon, please, please consider joining us on Saturday, August the 15th from 1 until 5 p.m. As Amy Houston will be back with us again, um, going over all of what we discussed today in a little more detail. It'll be more like a, an intermediate look at at what we learned today. And I highly recommend that, that you join us. I will also send you the link in the notes. So um, everyone is welcome. So. Can I if, just add um, yes. to that? I would, I would love to have you guys um, 
join me on that for that. I'm going to be talking a lot about swarming and I'm going to go into more detail on um, making splits and making nukes. Um, and I'm also going to be talking a little bit more in detail about nutrition and um, also a, a little bit focus more on brood diseases and not so much mites. So yeah, lot, lots about swarms and splits, which is kind of a second year thing. So it's terrific. And we need to know, just like we talked about, you know, walk away splits and stuff. Uh, we, we, as beekeepers, we need to have goals and we need to have a plan and we always need to be thinking ahead. So Amy is here on the 15th of August to help us do just that. Until then, we wish you all the best. And uh, if you're beekeeping, may your mic counts be low and your honey yields high. Just be healthy and we will hopefully see you again on the 15th of August. Take care, everyone. Bye now.